The Tiananmen Square Massacre is one of the most important, noteworthy tragedies in modern Chinese history. It was the biggest protest against communist rule in the past 60 years before it was squashed. Thanks to the consistent suppression and propaganda of the modern Chinese government, many, if not most, Chinese citizens today don't even know that the protest or the massacre that followed ever happened. Thankfully, the corrupt and oppressive Chinese government has no bearing on what we talk about here in the Suck Dungeon. At least not yet. On June 3rd and 4th, 1989, the Chinese People's Liberation Army killed hundreds, probably thousands, of protesting civilians, mainly students in and around Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China, demanding the government address a faltering economy and many basic citizen rights disavowed by communist rule that many of us here take for granted in the U.S. and elsewhere in the Western world, like free speech and freedom of the press. What started off as student-led peaceful protests Triggered by the death of a politician more open than most in China to moving towards democratic and capitalist freedoms, quickly developed into something bigger. As more and more students arrived, their demands grew louder. They refused to back down and stop protesting despite threats of punishment. Eventually, regular citizens, old and young, and even members of the military and minor government officials joined the protest. Group from all walks of life were now protesting for change, demanding their own various reforms. Communist Party leaders grew fearful that the protesters wanted to not just push for some changes, but to maybe overthrow the party itself. And they debated about how to end the protests. While some members did want to listen to the students' demands and engage in a dialogue, others wanted to end the protest as quickly as possible without acknowledging the protesters' demands for reforms. They worried that if they didn't squash the protest quickly, a wave of more protests would follow across the nation. They would grow larger, unruly. They worried the protests would turn into an actual revolution. After more than a month of protest, the voices in the government arguing for ending the protest without dialogue, voices of unequivocal suppression, well, they won out. And the government now decided to act decisively and use any means necessary to quickly put an end to the public dissent. They sent in thousands and thousands of soldiers with orders to clear the square. While peaceful removal was technically encouraged, there was also an order to remove the protesters by a hard deadline of 6 a.m. However, that happened. Not removing the protesters was not an option, and the army succeeded in carrying out their orders at the cost of many, many lives. And then the day after the protesters were massacred, one brave man walked out and stood in front of a line of tanks, refusing to get out of their way, risking his own life in an act of defiance, and he became known as the Tank Man. And photos of this David versus Goliath have been shared all over the world as an inspiring symbol for other protesters standing up to oppression. The impact of Tank Man and the students' rebellion are still relevant today, still powerful reminders of courage in the face of tyranny. But ironically, they have not done a lot of inspiring in the place they are arguably needed the most. Many youth in China not old enough to remember the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests and massacre as they occurred do not know these events even happened. China immediately made efforts to stop the distribution of photos and video of the massacre. International media were forbidden from documenting it as it happened. If it weren't for the bravery of some foreign journalists defying Chinese orders and courageous Chinese citizens subversively sharing their memories years later and helping smuggling film out of the country, the outside world may have never known about this terrible tragedy. We wouldn't know that the police arrested thousands of people and executed an unknown number of unarmed protesters and people who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. China is still trying to suppress information about this event to whitewash their history. With the rise of the internet, China began to employ and still employs advanced technology to censor any information about the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre and keep it away from its citizens. In the over 30 years since the massacre, while China's economy has come a long way, sadly, the personal freedoms for Chinese citizens, uh, freedoms that the protesters died for, have not. This week, we'll discuss why the Tiananmen Square protests occurred, the key players involved, what type of government the protesters wanted to reform, share a timeline of the protests from beginning to end, and discuss the aftermath and legacy of the Tiananmen Square massacre on another historical Freedom Isn't Free edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, a suck master, generic fighting man, action figure, franchise owner for a new Antonio Banderas' hot, hard father daddy's Italian bistro and male strip club. And you are listening to Time Suck. 
Hail Nimrod. I love you, Lucifina. Praise be to Bojangles. He is closely listening to today's Chock Full of Commies episode. And glory be to Triple M. Uh, thanks to everyone I met after recent shows in Kansas City and St. Louis. Oh, man. So fun. Thanks to everyone who bought tickets. Holy shit. Had a blast. Thanks to Moon and Riz from The Riz Show for introducing the shows in St. Louis. And Johnny Dare for making a little appearance in Kansas City. Uh, crazy about Moon sounding a microphone before the second show. If you were there, you know. Uh, such great guys, though, for real. Uh, this weekend, going to be in Sacramento and Denver. Denver is sold out, as is the early show at the Crest Theater in Sacramento. But still tickets for the late show in Sacramento. Available. Come on, Bay Area. Make it happen. Uh, come hear me say a bunch of crazy shit live. Uh, great news for the store right now. We got a beautiful, hot, hard daddy tea. It just hit the store. A gorgeous Roman bust of me. Hot father daddy Dan on a sultry neon background. Do you want everyone to notice how much you crave creamy Roman hot hard father daddies dripping in olive oil? Well, pick up that phone and call 1-900-HOT-DADDY and purchase your brand new rock hard, steamy, soaking, aching, pulsating, throbbing father daddy tea and sweatshirt. If you can't get through, it's because we're servicing so many other hot heart father daddies. Don't worry though, you can still order the shirt from badmagicmerch.com. And now how about that is it? Uh, And we mosey on over to today's topic. Just need to hit a little button to reset my mind. So how are we tackling today's historical subject? Well, first, I'm going to do a lot of victim blaming to establish how the protesters got, in fact, exactly what the fuck they deserved. Next, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about how wonderful and wise the Chinese government is and have always been. Hail China. Uh, Then I'm going to shit on disgusting left-wing radical Western capitalist pig journalists for the hatchet job they did on the coverage of this alleged tragedy. And in summary... I'm going to tell every one of you listening to go fuck yourself in this ill-advised career suicide implosive final episode of Time Suck. Let's fucking go! No, that's not what what I'm going to do today. I'd I'd rather not do that. I'd rather not do any of that. Uh, Instead, first, we're going to start with a brief overview of the Chinese Revolution of 1911 and the beginning of the People's Republic of China, followed by a brief explanation of the structure of the Chinese Communist Party, we need to understand what the protesters were protesting before we dive into covering the protests themselves. Then we'll discuss how the death of revered politician Hu Yaobang led the student protests in Beijing, followed by a timeline of the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre. After that, we'll discuss how China has changed in the over 30 years since the massacre, touching on censorship and uh, banned Tiananmen vigils in recent years. All right, here we go. Okay, starting off, as I said, way back in 1911, Uh, The Chinese Revolution in 1911 ended the Qing Dynasty, China's last imperial dynasty that had ruled since 1636. It's tempted to call it dynasty. (laughs) It sounds too pretentious. It ended the Qing Dynasty. Uh, And it established the Republic of China, which would reign kind of from 1912 to 1949. They always had a lot of fires. Uh, They could never quite put out. A lot of turmoil during the days of the uh, original, the OG ROC. Technically, the ROC still around. Very brief de- detour here. Uh, in 1949, two million soldiers followed Chiang Kai-shek, excuse me, Chiang Kai-shek, chairman of the national government of China, into exile into Taiwan following a long civil war. And then Kai-shek set up a provisional government there. And he would rule uh, in Taiwan until his death in 1975 and enforced uh, military martial law, excuse me, the entirety of his reign. Martial law was actually enforced in Taiwan all the way until 1987. During the 1950s, 1960s, after the ROC government had to withdraw to Taiwan upon losing the civil war, it was commonly referred to as nationalist China or free China to differentiate it from communist China or red China. And Taiwan was a member of the United Nations until 1971, when it then lost its seat to China. Uh, Taiwan, in addition to being officially known still as the Republic of China, also sometimes now known as Chinese Taipei, less a... inflammatory term as far as mainland China is concerned. Taiwan has its own military, its own government, a representative democrat, a democratic republic, excuse me, with its own constitution, but it is only recognized fully as a sovereign state by uh, 13 nations plus the Vatican uh, that it has full diplomatic relations with. 
The United States, not one of those nations. And why not? Well, the short answer is China is a big, uh, you know, fucking scary country. And like most of the rest of the world, we generally, despite the occasional tough talk of our leaders, do our best not to piss China off and risk their full economic or military wrath. No Bojangles. Not trying to acquire nukes to obliterate them. Bad dog. There's a lot of good people over there who want to be just as free as you. They didn't pick their shitty government, right? They just ended up getting an unlucky die roll when it came to where they were born. And China is fucking scary, right? It has the second largest economy in the world compared to the U.S. Or, you know, you know, U.S. is number one. China is number two. Uh, so following the U.S. And is projected to have the biggest economy in the world within the decade. China also has the single biggest active military in the world. Roughly 2 million active personnel followed uh, next on the list as far as terms of largest armies by India and then the U.S., Even though the U.S. has way more nukes, uh, a lot more warheads, roughly 5,500 compared to 350, China is a very powerful nation. And, uh, you know, many, uh, uh, you know, many think that they will be one of the world's, uh, or excuse me, the world's most powerful nation in every meaningful way in the next few decades. So if they say Taiwan is not a real country, well, fuck, I guess no matter how real it actually is, that's not a real country. If stating that officially keeps us from World War III, fine. Sorry, Taiwan. Just be happy that China is not invading and annihilating you, I guess. Shitty consolation prize. Uh, Many worry that a China slash Taiwan version of Russia, Ukraine is almost inevitable at some point. And I hope that's not the case. Okay, moving on now. We can do a whole suck on the unique political status of Taiwan and what has led to it. Uh, Back to what led to the ROC now, the fall of the Qing dynasty. I also cover this in episode 238, right? Mao Zedong, father of communist China and worst mass murder of all time. I'll summarize it again here a bit differently. During the Qing Empire, China had fought two opium wars against the West, both led by Britain, and they got their fucking asses kicked both times. First by Britain, then again by Britain and France. China lost Hong Kong and uh, more and was forced to open treaty ports for international trade, trade that was unfavorable to China. China also then lost the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1895, forcing them to give up more territory, including Taiwan, parts of Manchuria, and China lost its control over Korea. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 then allowed Japan to establish more claims in the Northeast, further weakened China. Uh, During the latter half of Qing Qing rule, uh, China just kept getting these fucking ass kicked, which uh, is generally not real good for citizen morale. Uh, These and other conflicts with the West and the East, as well as various internal frustrations with the government, led to increased nationalism in China. There were a lot of people who were very proud to be Chinese, who wanted someone else to run the show and restore some national pride back into uh, older imperial days when China was a fucking, you know, monster to be dealt with. Qing rulers attempted some reforms to appease detractors, but they were too late. For instance, in 1905, they abolished the exam system which had limited political power largely to the elite, who passed a civil service exam for centuries. For a thousand years or so, this system was used to select candidates for bureaucracy. This exam system is a, is a bit complicated to explain, but candidates for public office had to pass exams, serve to ensure a common knowledge of Chinese writing, Chinese classic, uh, you know, classics, music, literature, a traditional literary style among state officials, and all this reinforced a common culture in China, which helped unify the empire but eventually became outdated and it ensured that new types of thinking that revolutionary types of thinking by people not interested in memorizing and regurgitating China's old ways, the system, uh, you know, made sure they didn't make it into Chinese government. And with China continually getting pushed around by almost anyone who attacked them, more and more people were calling for a change in thinking. They were thinking enough of the old ways. They're not fucking working anymore. In their final years, Qing officials also worked on modernizing the military Uh, You know, created elected assemblies and increased provincial self-government. But again, too little, too late. There was too much poverty. There had been too much invasion by outside forces. Too many unfair trade deals made with the West. The military still too weak. More and more people wanted an end to the Qing dynasty. Millions of Chinese people living in China. Millions more overseas started pushing for revolution. Two men named uh, Kong Yuwei and Liang uh, Qichao became leaders and proposed a constitutional monarchy. They wanted to keep China imperial, but also modernize it. But uh, Sun Yat-sen led another group that formed the Revolutionary Alliance, which advocated for a non-imperial Republican government. And Sun Yat-sen is the only major Chinese political figure uh, revered today 
in both mainland China and Taiwan from the uh, 20th century. The ROC calls him the father of the nation, right? He's a, he's a hot, hard father daddy dripping in soy sauce. Do you like hot, hard Chinese father daddies? Call 1-900-HOT-DADDY to talk to real, nude, rock hard, revolutionary Chinese father daddies completely dripping in soy sauce. Moving on. Uh, the Revolutionary Alliance attempted at least seven revolts against the imperial government before the 1911 revolution, but all their attempts were stopped by the army. But then, eight-ish time was the charm. In the fall of 1911, an uprising in Wuchang led to a large nationalist revolt. As the revolt continued, you know, the uh, Qing leadership responded to new demands that would change their government to a constitutional monarchy. Uh, the Qing uh, named uh, Wen Shikai as Chinese as China's new premier, but he was unable to take back the areas captured by the revolutionaries because the provinces had declared their loyalty to the Revolutionary Alliance led by Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was in the uh, U.S. at the time on a fundraising tour. He traveled to London and Paris as well to ensure that they wouldn't give support to the Qing government or any puppet government they backed. When he got back, his revolutionaries had taken Nanjing. Representatives from various provinces now arrived for the first national assembly, and they elected soon as the provisional president of the Republic of China. The emperor and royal family abdicated the throne February of 1912. This is a big step for China, but there were still a lot of problems going on in China. The new republic uh, didn't start off on easy street. So many fucking problems. China's recent history is not a stable one. The country was still not unified. It was far from it. Now multiple local warlords took advantage of power vacuums to control territory without acknowledging the new government. And because of this, the new government had to be more focused on unification than actually implementing any actual reforms they had promised. Hard to pass reforms if many parts of the nation do not recognize your authority. Fucking warlords. After the Qing dynasty was defeated and Sun Yat-sen was elected president, he now had to flee Japan pretty quickly thanks to continuous uprisings and power struggles and leadership of China fell back to Wen Shikai, a military leader and longtime politician that was associated with the Qing dynasty. Uh, he, uh, Sun Yat-sen then called for further revolution to overthrow this dude. Meanwhile, Shikai, you know, becomes new emperor, fucking China, right back to imperial rule, but he'll only reign for 83 days. Failing health and more uprisings ended his brief rule, and he uh, goes back to being president. Well, he tries to. That's not enough for his detractors, who wanted him completely gone. Before overthrowing him, he will die uh, from health problems in 1916 at the age of 56. And side note on this motherfucker, uh, good thing he didn't remain emperor. That would have been quite the power struggle for the throne had he died as emperor because he had 32 kids that we know of. 32. Dude had a wife and nine concubines. Uh, after uh, uh, Shikai Hot Nuts passes, the country descends into what is called the warlord era. For a dozen years, these warlords were military leaders who had controlled different factions of Chinese, uh, China's army. And this history makes me think of one of Patrick Swayze's best films, 1989's original Roadhouse. Fuck the remake. This movie helped me understand this part of today's episode, actually. If you haven't seen it, well, it all starts with fucking Brad Wesley. Shitty little tyrant who ran a fictionalized Jasper, Missouri. Then Dalton moves to town. And he's just trying to clean up the double deuce. Just be a good bouncer. Yeah, he's small for a bouncer, but he's the best in the world. But he can't clean up the club because Brad fucking Wesley has most of the town in his pocket. And then Brad tries to have Dalton killed because, you know, Dalton's not going to back down to anybody. He tries to have him killed by a local tough guy, Jimmy Reno. And then Jimmy Reno fucks with the wrong dog in the fight. And he gets his throat ripped out. Second time, Dalton had to rip out a motherfucker's throat. Then Dalton goes full Rambo on Wesley's compound. And all the main bad guys die. And then the townsfolk, inspired by Dalton's courage to stand up to an oppressive regional dictator, well, they fucking kill Wesley after Dalton's already killed most of his goons. Well, pretend China had a bunch of Brad Wesleys in the early 20th century, and China's Dalton would be Chiang Kai-shek. It's not a great analogy, actually, but it kind of works. It kind of works. Uh, he became commander-in-chief of the National Revolutionary Army in 1926 following the power vacuum created by Sun Yat-sen's death. And then uh, he had a lot of dissonant throats ripped out across China to unify the nation. Uh, he, in theory at least, wanted to move China toward being a democracy, but the nation was still too fragile. 
Too many uprisings, various uh, factions with varying levels of power. He supported uh, modernization policies such as scientific advancement, uh, universal education, women's rights. His government acted to modernize the legal and penal systems, attempted to stabilize prices, uh, amortize debts or amortize debts, reform the banking and currency systems, build railroads and highways, improve public health facilities, legislate against traffic and narcotics and augment industrial and agricultural production and more. And he also had to deal with a lot of war. The Second Sino-Japanese War, lasting from 1937 to 1945. Uh, The Second Chinese Civil War, a.k.a. the Chinese Communist Revolution, that lasted from 1927 to 1949. So much instability in China in the first half of the 20th century. And who won the Chinese Civil War? Well, the fucking commies. And off to Taiwan goes Chiang Kai-shek. And easy bojangles. They're not here, good boy. You're safe in the suck dungeon. On October 1st, 1949, communist leader Mao Zedong declares the creation of the People's Republic of China. And again, we dedicated an entire episode to this ruthless motherfucker. That episode I mentioned earlier, Suck 238, right? Mao Zedong, father of communist China and worst mass murderer of all time. Uh, Mao's declaration ended the civil war between the Chinese Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, a.k.a. the Kuomintang uh, or KMT, which had been ongoing since the end of World War II. Chiang Kai-shek was the head of the KMT, and the KMT, by the way, were also kind of communist at some points, just never as much as Mao CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. There have been an on and off conflict between these two parties since 1920s. The KMT, much more pro-West, less in bed with Russia than the CCP. After China officially became a communist state in 1949, the U.S. now ended diplomacy with the country and would not resume diplomacy for many decades. The Chinese Communist Party had been founded in Shanghai back in 1921. Excuse me. Uh, The party was founded by young young urban intellectuals inspired by European socialist ideas and the success of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. They liked what Lenin and Stalin did up north, which says a lot. Which says a lot about them and uh, not, not much good in my mind. Back in the 1920s, they formed the first united front, an alliance between the CCP and the uh, KMT to end warlordism. Communists joined the Nationalist Army in the Northern Expedition of 1926 and 27 to rid the nation of the warlords that prevented the formation of a strong central government. Not today, Brad Wesleys. Get the fuck out of here before you get your throat tripped out. Uh, The cooperation between the two groups lasted until 1927 when the Nationalists committed the White Terror, where they killed communists or purged them from the party. Over a million people died. Over 10,000 communists were executed in a 20-day period. Big purge. And that'll definitely cause a rift in your alliance, executing over 10,000 members of your coalition who don't match their, uh, you know, an ideology uh, and causing over, you know, over a million deaths overall. So that happens. And then the Japanese invade Manchuria in 1930, 1931 and do so much fucking raping. Not kidding, unfortunately. Uh, remember the second part of the World War II two-parter? And now the government of the Republic of China is under a lot of stress. Not a fun time to be a politician there due to the constant threat of invasion or actually being invaded and then being captured and killed and maybe raped. And there's a massive communist uprising and there are still regional warlord insurrections to deal with. Now a group of generals, uh, you know, very frustrated with nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek because of his focus on internal affairs rather than the threat of Japan. There's just too many fires for anybody to put out. A group of generals abduct Kai-shek in 1937 for two weeks, force him to reconsider cooperating with the communist army Not sure if they tortured him or what, guessing he was probably not treated super kindly. And now the second United Front is formed, but doesn't last long. You know, uh, Kai-shek is not that into it. He was (laughs) uh, forced into this under a lot of duress. The nationalists are focused on containing the communists. The communists are focused on increasing their influence in rural China. And then during World War II, support for the communists increases. According to the United States Office of the Historian, U.S. officials in China reported a dictatorship dictator oh my gosh dictatorial suppression of uh, dissent in nationalist controlled areas Uh, these undemocratic policies combined with wartime corruption made the republic of china government vulnerable to the communist threat the chinese communist party made successful efforts at land reform and was praised by peasants for their efforts in fighting the japanese after the surrender of japan at the end of world war ii civil war starts up yet again in china in a big way the U.S. continued to support Chiang Kai-shek because he is not communist. Well, Jango's tail is wagging. U.S. forces even flew thousands of nationalist Chinese soldiers into Japanese-controlled territory and allowed them to accept the Japanese sur- surrender. 
But at the same time, the Soviet Union was occupying Manchuria and only left when Chinese communist forces were able to establish a claim in the territory. So this is the you know early stages of the old Cold War. Right, the, the fucking Soviet Union is trying to back their fucking regime. The U.S. trying to back theirs, and in this case, with China, the Soviets win. Uh, then, in 1945, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong meet for a series of talks on the government in the post-war period. They agreed, or at least pretended to agree, on democracy, a unified military, and equality among the Chinese political parties. But the talks failed as far as who was going to be in charge. Not surprisingly, neither leader wanted to concede power. And by 1946, the nationalists and the communists were engaged in a civil war and unable to form a coalition government. As the civil war continued, it seemed likely that the communists would win because they had more support, better military organization and morale, and large stocks of weapons taken from the Japanese supplies in Manchuria. The U.S. continued giving military and financial support to the nationalists despite the fact that they were losing and the fact that the Truman administration uh, didn't see much strategic importance in the U.S. maintaining relations with nationalist China. Ultimately, in 1949, Mao Zedong proclaims the establishment again of the People's Republic of China, and China becomes a communist country and is so to this day. The commies had won, and now Chiang Kai-shek and his forces flee to Taiwan. Because the nationalists were still in Taiwan, some anti-communists in the U.S. believed that things could still change. Obviously, that wasn't the case. During the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, the U.S. and China now uh, find themselves on opposite sides of a military conflict, less than 10 years apart from working together. My, how times have changed because Truman didn't want to let the war spread further south. The U.S. protected the nationalist government in Taiwan. Uh, Following the communist revolution, there was little contact trade and diplomatic ties between the U.S. and China. Uh, Until the 70s, the U.S. recognized the Republic of China in Taiwan as China's true government and supported the Republic of China's position in the U.N. But then, you know, the writing was on the wall. You know, China is fucking getting bigger, scarier militarily, and just a more important trade partner, right? More cheap factories and shit. So we hopped out of one bed and we laid down in another one. The way of the world, for the most part. Okay, now that historical overview is completed enough for today. Whole episode is not going to be this dense. It'll, it'll move a lot more in the second half. Uh, let's discuss the structure of the Chinese Communist Party, though. Uh, the Communist Party. Right, because this is the party that the protesters are protesting against. The Communist Party is the power center that controls all Chinese government departments, military, courts, and parliament. There are eight additional political parties in China. Uh, they exist in a situation called by the CCP a multi-party cooperation and political consultation under the leadership of the Communist Party of China. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of fancy words for they sit at the fucking kitty's table and they do not have a real voice. And if they ever express too much dissent, (laughs) you're going to be fucking re-educated, motherfuckers, or just executed Uh, or dissolved. Uh, Many minor parties have been dissolved, like the Democracy Party of China, founded in 1998 by former participants of the Tiananmen Square protests. And then that party was banned the same year, right? We here in China are not authoritarian. We love discourse with alternate points of view. You know, you don't like what we're about. Hey, form your own party. All parties are welcome. Oh, awesome. I'd like to form an anti-communist pro-Western democracy party, please. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right, you can work on our on your platform in one of our many re-education camps. And then cue that motherfucker being grabbed by guards, having a bag placed over his head, being whisked away and literally never seen by friends or family again. Yay, China. That is what life is actually like there. Uh, the CCP party has a pyramid structure. Currently, uh, Xi Jinping is at the top, the general secretary and president and chairman of the Central Military Commission. He consolidated all those roles and is uh, very powerful, considered by uh, many to be the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. He is firmly in charge and there are over 96 million party members below him. Uh, Xi Jinping has been the leader of the People's Republic of China since 2013. Uh, Yang Shang Kun was president in 1989 during the Tiananmen Square protests. Jinping is a leading member of the Politburo Standing Committee, the seven most powerful politicians in China. Its officially mandated purpose is to conduct policy discussions and make decisions on major issues when the larger Politburo decision making body, right, the big legislative body in China, is not in session. These seven men make up the inner circle of the Politburo, short for Political Bureau. The Politburo is made up of 24 members, including the seven on the standing committee. Most of the members are close to the president and his allies, 
Some of them have high roles in government, uh, just the political party or the military or a combination thereof. Underneath the general secretary is in the uh, Politburo is the premier of the state council of the People's Republic of China, a.k.a. the premier of China, a.k.a. the prime minister, uh, the head of government and lead leader of the state council. The premier is responsible for the National People's Congress and its standing committee. And the National People's Congress is who elects leaders, not the people. There are no democratic elections. The National People's Congress has a varying amount of delegates. 2,300 as of five years ago, according to some sources, it's thought to be around 3,000 now. How are they elected? Well, they're fairly elected by regional people's congresses, smaller congresses around the country below them. And how are those people elected? Well, it's fucking complicated. Supposedly, some are elected by local votes, but the votes, if they actually occur, probably rigged. In all reality, top party members decide who gets to be on the NPC. A small you know, cadre at the top decides everything in China, right? Nothing's left a chance. Exactly how it all works is very hard to determine due to China's intentional secrecy and propaganda. The National People's Congress is supposed to be the top governing body in China. Their main job is to write laws, supervise the government, but they don't write or supervise anything leadership uh, doesn't fucking agree with. You know, it could not be more different than what we have here in the U.S. in so many ways. Uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party state that China is democratic, but many foreign and even some domestic observers categorize China as an authoritarian one-party state. That seems a lot more ac- accurate. Uh, many characterize it as a dictatorship recently. Officially, the state council sits under the NPC. They enact policy and preside over all government departments. This is equivalent to uh, the cabinet in the U.S. government. The military is supposed to report to Congress through the Central Military Commission. The Communist Party chief leads this commission, which means that the party leads the People's Liberation Army, which, uh, again, as I mentioned, has about two million soldiers. And uh, then there is the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission, which is led by a uh, Politburo member and oversees the judiciary and prosecutors. The Central Commission for Disciplinary Inspection, used to enforce internal discipline and loyalty. And that group sounds fucking terrifying. I assume that if you answer the door and someone from the Central Commission for Disciplinary Inspection is there, you just start crying and you tell your loved ones goodbye. It's it's akin uh, somewhat to like a, like the Bureau of Internal Affairs for a police department. They're supposed to curb corruption within the party, but it seems like they're just more of a political tool used by leadership to punish anyone not loyal to current leadership. Uh, Xi Jinping had four high-ranking members punished by this group for taking bribes this past fall. But it was rumored that the real thing they did was just oppose his rule. And it's just easy to say this person took bribes and that's why they're going to go fucking disappear for a while. Uh, Then there is the Central Organization Department, a human resources department that assigns roles to party members. Every five years, the CCP convenes uh, the National Party Congress, not the same as the National People's Congress, to set policies and elect leaders. Uh, Members choose a central committee of 370 members. And this is thought to be largely a, a dog and pony show. You know, leadership likely know the outcomes of uh, elections, legislation again, you know, before the CCP convenes this National Party Congress. We can only guess what goes on behind the scenes to make sure everything goes as planned. Right. Very much like uh, strong pony boy Putin and Russia today. We know supposed elections over there are a fucking sham. We just don't know exactly how the sham is always pulled off. You know, who's pulling what strings. Anyway, the Central Committee serves as a board of directors for the party and is required to meet annually. Uh, The committee also selects the Politburo of 25 members. The Politburo uh, chooses the uh, uh, Politburo Standing Committee. And if some of these numbers, you know, some sort of said 25, some said 24, hopefully I cleaned it up correctly. But uh, again, it seems to be intentionally confusing. You know, there is a fair amount of guesswork exactly how the internal workings go over there because of, again, secrecy and propaganda. But the uh, Politburo chooses the Politburo Standing Committee, which serves as the epicenter of the CCP's power leadership. As I said earlier, the seven top positions, current leader Xi Jinping, uh, you know, led the party for uh, almost a decade now and consolidated control over the CCP and, quote, restored its central role in society and asserted China's global power. Some of the CCP's current challenges include slow economic growth, uh, environmental issues and tensions with the uh, West, especially the U.S., Some political experts on China have labeled Xi Jinping as the most influential Chinese leader since Mao, as I said earlier. She has promoted a vision of China's rejuvenation and pushed for more assertive foreign policy, which has increased tensions with the U.S. and allies. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, Xi's elevation marks the first time the CCP has moved towards strongman rule 
since former leader uh, Deng Xiaoping steered the party to consensus rule or collective leadership in the 1980s. Okay, now that we have a basic kind of understanding of China's recent history as a communist country and the structure of the CCP, let's discuss a few of the important figures in the upcoming Tiananmen Square protests and massacre. Uh, The Tiananmen Square protests have been called China's greatest political upheaval since the end of the Cultural Revolution. The protesters, protesters wanted an end to governmental corruption among elite party members uh, to have less restrictions placed on education, employment, family size, freedom of speech, freedom of press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a lot of people wanting a lot of different things. Uh, the protesting started on April 15th, 1989, among university students in Beijing, and then protests spread all across China. Didn't end until June 4th, 1989, when an estimated 300,000 soldiers from the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, massacred the protesters. I love this fucking propaganda, by the way. It's always like the most totalitarian fucking places, just the mo- most oppressive places have the nicest names. Like it's all about it's all about the people. It's the People's Liberation Army that will fucking annihilate the people if they do anything outside of the government's fucking firm orders for how to act. Right? But it sounds like, oh, it's, it's a liberation army for the people to make sure you have freedom when it's actually the exact opposite of that. PBS Frontline writes, throughout these weeks, China's top leaders were deeply divided over over how to handle the unrest, with one faction advocating peaceful negotiation and another demanding a crackdown. The protesting started after the death of Chinese politician Hu Yaobang. Yaobang was a political reformer. He held the top office of the CCP from 1981 to 1987, first as chairman from 1981 to 1982, then as general secretary from 1982 to 1987. They changed their terminology a lot. And this was back before Xi Jinping's rule, where there was a lot more room for uh, more of a conversation regarding important decisions than there seems to be now. He was allied with uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, paramount leader of the PRC from 1978 to 1989. Deng was the uh, chairman of the Central Military Commission from 1981 to 1989 before that role was, you know, uh, combined with the general secretary. And if this shit seems confusing regarding like their governmental structure and who's exactly in charge, It is confusing. (laughs) Again, uh, it's intentional, uh, I think. Seems like they add, you know, some new fucking position names at least once a decade. They switch what the position names actually mean from time to time, which one's the most important. Uh, You know, who who is actually publicly speaking to the Chinese people? That will rotate from the inner circle. So you might have somebody doing the most speaking, but they're not actually the person with the most power. It's like this weird fucking political shell game they play over there uh, to keep the world guessing how shit is actually ran. Right. Keep the keep the citizens guessing, too. Uh, I think not being able to concisely explain who the fuck runs your government is a strong indicator that your government is shit. Anyway, uh, Hu Yaobang was born in November of 1915, would die April 15th, 1989, the day that the protests began at the age of 73. He was born in the Hunan province and uh, he came from a poor family, left home when he was just 14, became a member of the CCP in 1933. When he was 17, he, he participated in the infamous Long March of 1934. In October 1934, during the Civil War in China, the communists broke through nationalist lines and fled from their headquarters in southwest China and went on this journey called the Long March, lasted about a year, and uh, they had to march about 4,000 miles. And that is a long fucking march, my God. After the Long March, uh, Mao Zedong would famously say that his, uh, his feet hurt really bad. And he also said, please, please, can I not have to walk that far again? Please, please, my toes need to hurt. No, he didn't say that. It'd be funny if he did, though, and talk like a baby. No, after the march, he emerged as the undisputed leader of the communists. Uh, in the 30s, who worked with future leader uh, Deng uh, Xiaoping and served as political commissar in the Second Field Army during the Chinese Civil War. A political commissar is uh, defined as a supervisory officer responsible for the political education ideology and organization of the unit to which they are assigned with the intention of ensuring political control of the military. Uh, Hu's ally, ally, Deng Xiaoping, was born on August 22nd, 1904, died on February 19th, 1997. Uh, Deng came from a landowning family. He studied in France in the 1920s, became a member of the communist movement, also studied in the Soviet Union. When he came back to China, he became a leader of a communist enclave established by Mao Zedong in 1931. After the Cultural Revolution, Hu and Deng were twice purged and twice rehabilitated, according to Chinese sources. Twice, that's the exact wording. Twice purged and twice rehabilitated. 
And what does that mean? Well, it means that they uh, they didn't agree with Mao on some shit and were uh, very likely sent to one of China's re-education camps where they were fucking tortured as long as it took to get their minds right. These re-education camps, according to Amnesty International, are still very much around. There's a lot of them in China and are, quote, places of brainwashing, torture, and punishment that hark back to the darkest hours of the Mao era. Uh, the organization estimates that about uh, a million Chinese people are in these camps right fucking now as you listen to this episode. Well, as I record it. I don't know. I don't know how long this episode will hang out on the internet. Uh, 1977, who became director of the party's organization department and was then made a member of the Politburo and was named propaganda chief. Always a good sign of a fair, noble government when they literally have a propaganda chief. That's cool. Who helped his mentor, uh, Deng Xiaoping, consolidate power in the 1970s? 1978, Deng Xiaoping launched economic reforms and, uh, quote, four modernizations in industry, agriculture, science, and defense. That's a big thing they talked about for a long time. We're going to move things forward with industry, agriculture, science, and defense. Uh, and they have actually done a good job of that. Uh, during his reign, a part of a, of a wall near a commercial district in Beijing actually became known as the Democracy Wall for a little while. And it was used as a space, right, where people could put up posters and criticize the government. They're, they've changed. They're nice communists now. And then uh, that wall went away after just a few months because <laughs> there was a lot of criticism. And they were like, oh, no, we don't like this, actually. Fuck that. 1979, the government suppressed the wall and arrested activists <laughs> who wrote anything critical on the wall. And those activists were re-educated or executed. This shit kills me for people living in America today or any other nation, uh, you know, uh, that has basic human freedoms who uh, support communism, right? If it was such a great fucking system of government, why historically do they not tolerate any criticism the communist governments of China, the Soviet Union, Cuba, North Korea, other communist states, right? Uh, real averse to criticism in recent history. As in people routinely disappear or disappeared back in the Soviet era uh, are openly executed or get re-educated, i.e. fucking tortured and imprisoned when they dare to criticize the government. In my opinion, communism is for heartless tyrants and mindless fools. Never put that much trust in the state. Not fucking ever. Big Brother can always go suck a big bag of all the dicks. February of 1980, who was appointed General Secretary of the CCP and was elected to the Political Bureau's Standing Committee? His elevation was engineered by Deng, his mentor and de facto leader of China. And that's a lot of the stuff that goes on, too. Since there's not actually democratic elections, it's a lot of, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. And, you know, there's different little, like, rival factions within party elite and they, you know, one faction just ends up, you know, kind of taking power behind the scenes and they move their people into the important positions and there's fucking bribes and constant corruption. It's a fucking dumpster fire. Uh, General Secretary Hu replaced Maoist ideology with what he called seeking truth from facts. Who helped abolish the post of chairman at a party congress in 1982 and helped oversee the purging of Maoists and corrupt party members in the 1980s? More purging. So many purges in communism. Right. Uh, and it always says like they're always purging like corrupt party members. I doubt it. They're purging people who just don't agree with them, who might, uh, you know, expose them for their own corruption. Who uh, who may have been an all right dude? Maybe he was often criticized for praising so-called Western Western ways. For example, during a 1984 trip to Inner Mongolia, he suggested using individual plates, forks and knives to avoid contagious diseases. I love that he got criticism for that. How dare he promote basic common sense hygiene? You know, when traditional ways are not as hygienic. He also started, and this was causing uproar, he also started wearing a jacket and a tie. Mm -hmm. Rather than the Mao suit, as it was called. Started dressing like some dude who might be from Europe or some shit. What the fuck? Well, why not just hire an actor and dress up like uh, Uncle Sam and constantly put that guy's balls in your mouth, who? If you want to look so Western. Uh, who also criticized for moving too fast towards the market and for his tolerance of dissident intellectuals. And that is another shit character flaw of communism, a special hatred of intellectuals, right? He's criticized for tolerating intellectuals. Reminds me of Pol Pot, purging intellectuals from Cambodia. Uh, when asked uh, which of Mao Zedong's thoughts could apply to Chinese efforts at economic modernization, he answered, I think none. And that pissed a lot of people off who revered Mao. 1987, who uh, was ousted as general secretary by, quote, hardliners who accused him of bourgeois liberalization that had contributed to some student protests that year and the year before. 
lost the faith of the upper elite by being too open to dialogue. Back in late fall of 1986, small groups of students in several cities staged some peaceful demonstrations demanding political reform. On January 16th, 1987, a television announcer read a statement from Hu, uh, who had resigned after making a self-criticism of his mistakes on major issues of political principles in violation of the party's principle of collective leadership. Mm -hmm. The New York Times wrote that his resignation came amidst a flurry of secret meetings that are still not entirely understood. Yeah, no one understands so much of this. I'm guessing he resigned rather than suffer some kind of fatal accident or have some family members, you know, disappear. Uh, Zhao Yu Young then becomes general secretary after Hu steps down. And then Li Peng becomes the premier of China, right? Uh, Li was the most visible part, uh, you know, party member during the protests and thought to be second or third in charge, kind of behind uh, Zhao uh, Yu Young, also behind uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, it gets a little uh, crazy. Deng Xiaoping, chairman of the Central Military Commission during the Tiananmen Square protests. Li Peng was born in 1928, died July 22nd, 2019. Premier of China from 1988 to 1998. Chairman of the Standing Committee of the NPC from 1998 to 2003. As a young man, Li studied at the Moscow Power Institute in Russia and returned, well, Soviet Union at that time, returned to China in 1955. Moscow Power Engineering Institute is a public university in Moscow that offers training in power engineering, electric engineering, radio engineering, lots of, lots of engineering, electronics, information technologies, and management. From 1955 to 1979, at least supervised major electrical power projects in China. After learning from the Soviets in June of 1983, he was appointed vice premier by the NPC, and he advocated for a cautious approach to economic liberalization. He wanted to maintain political stability as the economy slowly modernized. And I do understand because of the history went over earlier, you know, the urge for some of these guys to uh, do things slowly and maintain political stability because it was a shit show in China as far as uh, centralized, you know, leadership for the entire first half of the 20th century, essentially. Now let's meet another dude in the inner circle of power and confusion during the protests. A guy whose name we just heard, Zhao Yu Yang. Zhao was born on October 17th, 1919. Died January 17th, 2005. Zhao was born in the uh, Hunan province. Served as premier of China from 1980 to 1987 and general secretary of the CCP from 87 to 89. Zhao had been a member of the CCP since 1938. All these guys are middle-aged or senior citizens. Uh, you know, long-time commies by the time of the student Tiananmen protests. Their minds were not going to be changed. Uh, this motherfucker was also purged during the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> Had to do a little purging and rehabilitation, get, get his mind tortured until he was thinking in line with everyone else. And he became first party secretary in 1975 in the Sichuan province, became a member of the Politburo Standing Committee in 1980. Zhao advocated for any structure, system, policy, or measure that could stimulate forces of production. Britannica writes throughout the 1980s, Zhao's pragmatic measures led to rapid increases in both agricultural and light industrial production. And his policies became the guiding principles for China's future economic development. As mentioned previously, Zhao became general secretary after Hu's resignation and Li Peng took over premiership. Uh, Deng Xiaoping would uh, hold Hu responsible for campus demonstrations that called for political reforms. However, Hu uh, would remain a member of the standing committee until he died. Hu Yaobang suffered a fatal heart attack during a Politburo meeting on April 8th, 1989, died a week later, April 15th, 1989, at 73 years old. Was he poisoned? If so, no one can prove it. Doesn't seem like he was. Uh, after Hu died, large groups of student mourners came to Tiananmen Square and called for governmental and societal reform. Some students held up a banner with Hu's portrait, calling him China's spirit. They opposed corruption, nepotism a decline in living conditions. In the following days, thousands of protesters came out and then the demonstrations spread outside of Beijing. And that caused a lot of alarm amongst Communist Party leadership. After 10 days, the initial protests started to die down. But then the People's Daily Newspaper published an, editor an editorial titled The Necessity for a Clear Stand Against Turmoil. And the People's Daily Editorial accused the protesters of conspiring to overthrow the government. The students were furious at the accusation. They called themselves patriots who just wanted to improve China. And I'm guessing that journalists for that paper existing in a corrupt communist state were for fucking sure pressured to write what they wrote. And by pressure, I mean possibly just given what they were to print. Uh, whoever told them, you know, to write about the uh, protest, write what they wrote, fucked up. 
if they just would have not addressed the protest. Now, uh, not called the protesters traitors, it seems very likely, according to Western sources, that the protest would have just died down and been done with. But now there's a resurgence, right? The, the, the number of protesters were fading right before the editorial came out. But now it's like some gas had been thrown on a fire that looked like it was going to die out on its own, right? Whoops. According to the Associated Press, the tone of the editorial raised the strong possibility that participants could be arrested and tried on national security charges. After the publication of this, more protests break out, increasingly big protests in different Chinese cities. Student leaders began a coordinated hunger strike to demand a dialogue with the country leaders and demand recognition of their movement as patriotic and democratic. The formal welcoming, adding to this uh, mess, the formal welcoming ceremony for uh, Gorbachev, right? Soviet uh, Soviet Union's premier was canceled due to these protests, which became a big loss of face for the Chinese government. Protesters knew, of course, about uh, Gorbachev's visit. They knew that event was bringing a lot of Western journalists into the nation, you know, who, who would be there to cover the protests. I'm sure that emboldened them in their effort to protest. I wonder if they thought that China would be reluctant to use deadly force around a bunch of Western journalists. They, of course, would be wrong if they thought that. On May 18th, 1989, the student leaders had a meeting with Premier uh, Li Peng and other officials, but it didn't lead to any progress. The students' complaints were not just about freedom, they were about economics. China's economy is 24 times the size now that it was back in 1989, despite its population only increasing from 1.12 billion to 1.4 billion. Uh, Over the past 40 years, going back seven years before the protests and massacre, the number of people in China with incomes below $1.90 US per day, the international poverty line as defined by the World Bank to track global extreme poverty, has fallen by close to 800 million people. Back in 1989, China was one of the most extremely impoverished nations in the world. Now, overall, economically, it's doing better than the US. People are even more likely to protest over extreme poverty than they are over a a lack of freedoms. The day after failed talks between students and the government, May 19th, 1989, the government declares martial law. But then when the military initially comes in to squash student protests, they're met with unexpected kickback. Students and other residents of Beijing had actually managed to block the first wave of military vehicles attempting to enter the city with uh, roadblocks made of cars, buses, whatever they could find. Students came to Beijing across the country. Protests uh, spread to about 400 other city, uh, other cities as well. The army left and the government reconvened to figure out their next move. And they decided that the only way to end the protest was to send in the army again. An estimated 180,000 uh, soldiers by one source. Armed police are sent to the city on June 3rd, 1989. Beijing residents, especially in the neighborhoods of Mushidi and uh, Shidan, resist the soldiers again. They barricaded routes again into uh, where they were protesting with buses, trucks, anything they get their hands on. And citizens ended up setting trucks, buses, and military vehicles on fire. And then shit got crazy and unarmed civilians started to die. Shots are fired. So many shots. Soldiers closed in on Tiananmen Square, the hub of the protesting. Some students refused to leave until they were persuaded by other student leaders. The city's hospitals soon became crowded with wounded and dead civilians. Hundreds, if not thousands of people were killed in Beijing. Also in other cities that night where uh, there were not Western journalists to document what happened. Because of that, we don't know what happened around much of the country at the same time. Western powers in Hong Kong condemned the army's actions after the massacre. Chinese uh, leadership didn't care. Not really. Within three years, by 1992, China had restored most of their overseas relationships. They restricted more freedoms than they had in years in the wake of the protest. The economy, though, is now booming. After the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, Deng Xiaoping relaunched economic reforms that brought in a new period of growth in China. The protests were initially labeled a counter-revolutionary riot, but now were called political turmoil and then not acknowledged at all. The Chinese government still uh, does what it can to hide the fact that these protests ever occurred. The government has never apologized or expressed any regret for the massacre and has rejected all outside investigations. Over 30 years after the Tiananmen Square massacre, Hu Yaobang is still being honored. On the 30th anniversary of his death, several notable organizations posted on Weibo, a popular Chinese social media platform used by uh, over 250 million Chinese now in honor of Hu. But the hashtag 30th anniversary of Hu Yaobang's passing was actually deleted from the site to help curb any kind of critical online activity. Of course it was. Bojangles is laughing. This is uh, how it works in a communist nation. Uh, The Washington Post writes, many young Chinese will know little, if anything, about Hu's role. 
All but the most anodyne references to events related to Tiananmen Square are scrubbed from China's history textbooks, and all discussion of it is centered on the Chinese internet. Yay, censorship! Things are going fucking great in your country when it censors your internet. According to the Washington Post, whose anti-corruption activism is helpful for current General Secretary Xi or uh, Xi Jinping, who's also promising an end to corruption, uh, they focus on that part of whose legacy. Uh, since Xi Jinping took power, 1.5 million officials have been imprisoned. But again, how many of them are imprisoned for you know being corrupt? How many are just critical of Xi Jinping? How many have been scapegoats? Okay, the hard part of the episode is now over. With all this information, you know, this information dense context now established. I uh, wanted to pull my fucking hair out trying to comprehend the confusing and corrupt spiderweb that is the CCP's organizational structure. Let's now cover the Tiananmen Square protests and massacre from beginning to end. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. All righty. April 15th, 1989. It all begins. Former Communist Party General Secretary Hu Yaobang, and as we have said, dies of a heart attack at the age of 73. Uh, he was a leading reformist, more open to quickly moving China's faltering economy towards Western capitalism than his peers, and his death worries many students who are not feeling great about their financial future in China. They're also craving more freedoms than their parents did. Right? They didn't grow up like many of their parents and grandparents amidst constant fighting and upheaval. They've had more stability, but also poverty. They've had more security, but also more time to think about the future and what could be as opposed to just worrying about ever-present turmoil. Right, a generation more likely to protest. On April 17, 1989, tens of thousands of students started gathering in Tiananmen Square in Beijing to mourn who. The square is described by PBS as the nation's symbolic central space. It's like the Chinese equivalent of Times Square right here in the States or the equivalent of Moscow, Russia's Red Square. And it's also the biggest public city square in the world. Hundreds of students marched into the square, laid a wreath at the monument to the people's revolutionary heroes. This big 10-story uh, obelisk uh, that was erected as a national monument of China to the martyrs of revolutionary struggle during the 19th and 20th centuries in 1958. And they laid it to honor Hu Yaobang by this symbol again of political reform and anti-corruption to many of them. The students used his legacy to ask for increased freedom of speech, economic freedom, and an end uh, to government corruption, and so more. Right, All very noble, you know, good things to ask for. But they're also essentially asking to be done with communism in order to get a lot of this shit. From April 18th through the 21st, uh, 1989, the demonstrations increase in Beijing and start to spread to other cities and universities. Workers, even minor government officials, start to protest against issues of inflation, their salaries, their housing, and more. Right, as far as housing goes, in China, you can own a house, but you can't own the land it sits on. That's owned by uh, the state. That sounds fun, right? According to the BBC, the demonstrations become fucking massive by the end of April. Over a million students and workers occupy the square in immediate vicinity at one point. The Tiananmen Square protest is the largest political protest in communist China's history. This is a big fucking deal. What this big deal? These protests are, Chikatilo. Nothing quite like this has ever happened to the communists before. Party leaders started to worry that the demonstrations will lead to chaos and rebellion. One group of party leaders led by Premier right, Li Peng, who was the second ranking in the party hierarchy at this point, suspected that, quote, black hands of bourgeois liberal elements are secretly working to undermine the government. Uh-huh. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is a bunch of students are smart enough to know that you guys are a bunch of fucking dipshit garbage leaders. A minority faction led by the party general secretary, uh, Zhao Yuyang, believed the student mainstream is good and the government should affirm their patriotism. Although, you know, any inappropriate methods of action should be pointed out to them. Li Peng wanted the protest to be nipped in the bud, but uh, Zhao Yuyang convinces Li and his supporters to wait it out, arguing, our main task right now is to be sure that the memorial service for comrade Yao Bong goes off smoothly. So that's what they do for the time. Let's let these uh, people protest. April 22nd, 1989, over 100,000 university students assemble outside the Great Hall of the People, the site of uh, Hu Yao Bong's memorial service. Three students carried a petition of their demands up the steps of the Great Hall, insisted on meeting with Li Peng, but he does not respond. Over the next few days, students boycott their classes and form unofficial student unions, which was illegal. To have a legal student union, the CCP has to approve your student group. Getting together to talk about whatever the fuck you want to talk about with a group of like-minded people 
and not keep the CCP informed of what you are discussing, not okay in China in 1989, not legal. I don't think it's okay or legal today. Right? These motherfuckers uh, were risking re-education by doing this. April 25th, 1989, 10 days after Yao Bong's death, Li Peng calls for a meeting of the Politburo while Zhao Yuyang is visiting North Korea. Right, Zhao Yuyang, the voice of reason in today's story. So he's gone. This other guy, Li Peng, gets the rest of the people together and be like, ah, what well, let's fucking crush these motherfuckers. This meeting is dominated by party members antagonistic to the students. Uh, the group convinced Deng, uh, Zhao Ping, de facto head of the state, that the students wanted to overthrow him and the Communist Party and they needed to act. Maybe the students did, but I don't think it was that explicit. Uh, Deng decided that the party had, to, ha- had been tolerant and restrained up until this point, but that now they needed to act. He said, we must explain to the whole party and nation that we are facing a most serious political struggle. We've got to be explicit and clear in, oppos- in opposing this turmoil. On April 26, 1989, the People's Daily, a state newspaper, publishes an editorial titled The Necessity for a Clear Stand Against Turmoil. But sadly, by this time, the protests are starting to die down, right? Most Western, uh, you know, uh, experts on this protest and, and massacre that follows think that if they just would have fucking not published this editorial, that the protest would have just died down and just went away over the next few months. But instead, they fanned the flames. The editorial mirrors Deng Xiaoping's opinions from the April 25th meeting. The following is a translation of this editorial. In their activities to mourn the death of comrade Hu Yaobang communists, or sorry, I'll start over. In the activities to mourn the death of comrade Hu Yaobang, communists, workers, peasants, intellectuals, cadres, members of the People's Liberation Army, and young students have expressed their grief in various ways. They've also expressed their determination to turn grief into strength, to make contributions in realizing the four modernizations and invigorating the Chinese nation. Some abnormal phenomena have also occurred during the morning activities. Taking advantage of the situation, an extremely small number of people spread rumors, attacked party and state leaders by name, and instigated the masses to break into the Xinhua Gate at Zhongnan Hai, where the party central committee and the state council are located. Some people even shouted such reactionary slogans as down with the Communist Party. In Shan and Changsha, there have been serious incidents in which some lawbreakers carried out beating, smashing, looting, and burning. <laughs> I like when they point out that the protesters dared to critique party members by name. A government that considers itself above critique, above criticism, is not a government worth having. Taking into consideration the feelings of grief suffered by the masses, the party and government have adopted an attitude of tolerance and restraint, right? They're fucking good guys. Toward some improper words uttered and actions carried out by the young students when they were emotionally agitated. On April 22nd, before the memorial meeting was held, some students had already showed up at Tiananmen Square, but they were not asked to leave, as they normally would have been. Instead, they were asked to observe discipline and join in the morning for comrade Hu Yaobang. I like that twist. They were protesting. They were asked to, you know, join in the morning. We're controlling this shit. Uh, The students on the square were themselves able to consciously maintain order. We got this. Owing to the joint efforts by all concerned, it was possible for the memorial meeting to proceed in a solemn and respectful manner. However, after the memorial meeting, an extremely small number of people, I like to focus, extremely small. This is is just a couple fucking distance that we got to fucking shut the fuck up. Not most people who love what we're doing. So yeah, he says, however, after the memorial meeting, an extremely small number of people with ulterior purposes continued to take advantage of the young students' feelings of grief for comrade Hu Yaobang to spread all kinds of rumors to poison and confuse people's minds using both big and small character posters. (laughs) That's a weird detail. They didn't, listen, they weren't just putting up dissenting opinions with like small fonts, okay? They fucking, they took it too far. They put big fonts on the poster so people could, you know, read it. <laughs> the audacity. Uh, but using both big and small character posters, they vilified, hurled invectives at, and attacked party and state leaders. How dare a free opinion be shared? How dare anyone put up a poster attacking a politician? What if they saw it? What if their mom saw it? What if their hot, hard, nude father daddy saw it? 
Oh, men simply dripping in soy sauce. Oh, that's a running gag for the Julius Caesars uh, suck, by the way, if you are new and so confused. Uh, Back to the CCP's official published statement. Blatantly violating the Constitution, they called for opposition to the leadership by the Communist Party and the socialist system. In some of the institutions of higher learning, illegal organizations were formed to seize power from the student unions. In some cases, they even forcibly took over the broadcasting systems on the campuses. In some institutions of higher learning, they instigated the students and teachers to go on strike and even went to the extent of forcibly preventing students from going to classes, usurped the name of the workers' organizations to distribute reactionary handbills, and established ties everywhere in an attempt to create even more serious incidents. These facts prove that what this extremely small number of people did was not to join in the activities to mourn comrade Hu Yaobang or to advance the course of socialist democracy in China. Neither were they out to give vent to their grievances. Flaunting the banner of democracy, they undermined democracy and the legal system. What fucking democracy are they referring to here? There is no democracy in the CCP. Bojangles just muttered lies and propaganda. That's right. He can speak perfect English when he wants to. Uh, the statement continues. Their purpose was to, sh- was to sow dissension among the people, plunge the whole country into chaos and sabotage the political situation of stability and unity. Don't fuck with our power. Uh, this is a planned conspiracy and a disturbance. Its essence is to once and for all negate the leadership of the CPC and the socialist system. This is a serious political struggle confronting the whole party and the people of all nationalities throughout the country. If we are tolerant of or conniving with this disturbance and let it go unchecked, a seriously chaotic state will appear. Or a much better democratic Western not shitty communist state will rise from the fucking human rights trampling ashes of this shit show. Or that. Uh, Also, the CPC is the same thing as the CCP. uh, Chinese Communist Party, Communist Party of China, uh, same shit. Then, the reform and opening up, the improvement of the economic environment and the, oh boy, uh, recidification of the economic order, construction and development, the control over prices, oh sorry, rectification, there's a lot of letters in that word, the rectification of the economic order. I know a lot of you are probably fucking really thrown there. What? What kind of, are you talking about rectification or fucking what, dude? I don't know if I've ever even heard that word before. Uh, got to fucking rectify with some rectification. Uh, but okay, I'm going to back up because now I've made it confusing. Then the reform and opening up, the improvement of the economic environment and the rectification of the economic order, construction and development, the control over prices, the improvement of our living standards, the drive to oppose corruption and the development of democracy and the legal system expected by the people throughout the country, including the young students, will all become empty hopes. Even the tremendous achievements scored in the reform during the past decade may be completely lost. And the great aspiration of the revitalization of China cherished by the whole nation will be hard to realize. A China with very good prospects and a very bright future will become a chaotic and unstable China without any future. Ha! If China's government really was cherished by the whole nation, there wouldn't be these big protests, would there? I love how they sell so much fear. Oh, we we have to stop these protesters or all of your freedom, all of this economic... There is no freedom. There's very little freedom in China, as he's saying this, and it's an economic, uh, it's a fucking disaster at this point in history. He says, the whole party and the people nationwide should fully understand the seriousness of this struggle. Unite to take a clear-cut stand to oppose the disturbance and firmly preserve the hard-earned situation of political stability and unity, the constitution, socialist, democracy, and the legal system. Under no circumstance should the establishment of any illegal organizations be allowed. It is imperative to firmly stop any acts that can use any excuse to infringe upon the rights and interests of legitimate organizations of students. Those who have deliberately fabricated rumors and framed others should be investigated to determine their criminal liabilities according to law. Bans should be placed on unlawful parades and demonstrations on such acts as going to factories, rural areas, and schools to establish ties. Beating, smashing, looting, and burning should be punished according to law. It is necessary to protect the just rights of students to study in class. The broad masses of students sincerely hope that corruption will be eliminated and democracy will be promoted. <laughs> there is no fucking democracy. <laughs> I love this. We're, we're, we're for the students. We're just trying to help so many students who are being corrupted by this small group of anarchists. These two are the demands of the party and the government. These demands can only be realized by strengthening the efforts for improvement and rectification. 
vigorously pushing forward the reform and making perfect our socialist democracy and our legal system under the party leadership. Under party leadership. I think those were the most important words of the last chunk there. Bend the knee. Respect our authority. All comrades in the party and the people throughout the country must soberly recognize the fact that our country will have no peaceful days if this disturbance is not checked resolutely. This struggle concerns the success or failure of the reform and opening up the program of the four modernizations and the future of our state and nation. Party organizations of the CPC at all levels, the broad masses of members of the Communist Party and the Communist Youth League, all Democratic parties and patriotic Democratic personages and the people around the country should make a clear distinction between right and wrong, take positive action and struggle to firmly and quickly and quickly stop the disturbance. Uh Uh-huh. He might as well have uh, signed that off with uh, and Heil Hitler. Fuck China's Communist Party, right? They are for fucking anything but the people. On April 27th, they're just, man, it's just so much fear-mongering, so much fucking typical political fear-mongering there. On April 27th, tens of thousands of students are now uh, staging another demonstration in Beijing, right? They're all riled up about this editorial. Uh, more demonstrations quickly spread to other cities. Now at Tiananmen Square, there are not only students, but all kinds of other citizens protesting as well. Jan Wong, a foreign journalist who was in Beijing, told PBS, in Beijing, one in 10 of the population was joining in. All of the old people, all the little children. So it was massive. You had doctors and nurses and scientists and army people demonstrating. The Chinese Navy was demonstrating. And I thought, this is extraordinary because who's left? It's just the top leaders who aren't out there. From April 29th to May 3rd, 1989, leaders are still arguing about how to deal with the protests internally. Their goal is to stop all the protests and get students to go back to their classes and just for everyone to shut the fuck up and go home. Uh, Zhao Yuyang and his supporters want to negotiate still with protesters. He is emphasizing that the government should deal with the protesters' legitimate complaints. Li Peng and his supporters want to restore social stability before considering any reforms. May 4th, 1989, tens of thousands of students march in Tiananmen Square for the 70th anniversary now of the 1919 May 4th movement, which took place in Tiananmen Square. Uh, Students promised to return to class on May 5th, but intended to keep pushing for reforms after doing so. And I'll explain that May 4th movement in uh, just a moment. Uh, Zhao Yuyang now gave a speech to foreign bankers during which he expressed his support for the students' patriotism. This statement... Not well received by his buddies back in the uh, inner core of uh, communist leadership because it contradicted the April 26th editorial. So this, uh, you know, greatly angers senior members of the Communist Party. Uh, Zhao Yu went fucking rogue. Big no, no, big no, no with a collective communist leadership. And this is before, you know, it was more of a dictatorship than it is currently as thought by a lot of uh, Chinese experts. Uh, The May 4th demonstrations were the largest pro-democracy demonstration China had seen since the beginning of communist rule. The May 4th movement was an intellectual movement that wanted a stronger China. On May 4th, 1919, college students staged demonstrations to protest the Versailles Treaty, which ceded German territories in China to Japan rather than give them back to China. The demonstrations led to a new phase of national consciousness. The May 4th movement thus uh, symbolized patriotism among young people. And the May 4th period was an era of intellectual debate concerning the roles of traditional Chinese culture, modern science, and Western-style democracy. Okay, cutting back to 1989 now. From May 5th through the 12th, but yeah, you can see why May 4th was an important day for these protesters. From May 4th through the 12th, 1989, uh, students returned to classes, and according to PBS, the movement was in flux and lacks leadership. And if there had been a leader, you can bet your ass that guy would have been seriously re-fucking educated. More likely, he would have been, uh, you know, fucking disappeared forever or executed as a traitor. Over 60 different crimes uh, were punishable by death in China, by the way, at this time. Despite the risk, some factions plan to demonstrate further and plan to hunger strike. While all this is happening, the party is also preparing for Soviet Party Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Beijing. Big deal. Deng Xiaoping wanted to end the protest peacefully. At least he claimed that publicly, but insisted that the students had to get out of Tiananmen Square before Gorbachev. You, you don't fuck with Gorbachev's meeting with us. Do, do not embarrass me. But, Zhao, uh, but uh, Zhao Yu Young was unable to convince the students to end their demonstrations before Gorbachev's arrival, which causes him to lo- lose further favor with senior party members. May 13th, 1989, 160 students in anticipation of uh, Gorbachev's visit start a hunger strike in Tiananmen Square. 
Their main reason was, quote, the government's failure to respond to requests for dialogue. One of the students' printed manifestos stated, The nation is in crisis, beset by rampant inflation, illegal dealing by profiteering officials, abuses of power, corrupt bureaucrats, the flight of good people to other countries, and deterioration of law and order. Compatriots, fellow countrymen who cherish morality, please hear our voices. The students had garnered a lot of support and important intellectuals, quote, pledged to help them, according to journalist Jan Wong, talking to PBS, who also said there's such a feeling in China about food because of the thousands of years of famines that we've had. So when the students went on their hunger strike, it really moved people to tears. And brave act. Hail Nimrod. May 15th, Mikhail Gorbachev arrives in Beijing. Uh, This is the first Sino-Soviet summit since 1959, right? Long time, 30 years. Uh, Well, this is another uh, big deal, huge deal. And the government cancels their plans to welcome him in Tiananmen Square because of the fucking pesky hunger strike. So they're embarrassed. It's a big uh uh-oh. A lot of expletives being bounced around party headquarters for sure. Jen Wong said, for the Chinese government, this was a big loss of face, very scary. They were aware of what was happening in the Soviet Union, and so were the Chinese people, that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was more or less imploding. The party leaders were very frightened in China. Yeah, I bet they were. I'm sure they were very worried about being overthrown, and if they were going to be overthrown, decent chance they would be imprisoned, re-educated, or executed. May 16th, over 3,000 people now are participating in this hunger strike. The party is very embarrassed, right? This is still going on during Gorbachev's visit. Right, which increases tensions further between them and the students. During an emergency meeting, uh, Zhao Yuyang maintains his standstill that the government should retract the April 26th editorial to end the strike and begin a dialogue with the students. He said, the vast majority of student demonstrators are patriotic and sincerely concerned for our country. We may not approve of all of their methods, but their demand to promote democracy, to deepen the reforms, and to root out corruption are quite reasonable. <laughs> oh, Zhao Yuyang, you done just fucked up. Reason has no place in communist China, dipshit. Oh, boy. You fuck. How dare you preach reason, you communist disgrace. Uh, Li Peng disagrees, saying it's more and more clear that a tiny minority is trying to use the turmoil to reach its political goal, which is repudiation of the communist party leadership and the socialist system. Their goals are to topple the Chinese communist party, to completely repudiate the people's democratic dictatorship. Did you say democratic dictatorship? Is that a thing? Uh, May 17th, 1989, Deng Xiaoping decides to disregard Zhao's recommendation to work with the students and proposes martial law, saying the aim will be to suppress the turmoil once and for all and to return things quickly to normal. This is the unshirkable duty of the party and the government. Zhao expresses his problems with his plan, but eventually says, I will submit to party discipline. The minority does yield to the majority. May 18th. Uh, Zhao Yu Young once again visits some of the protesters who are hospitalized due to the hunger strike. He attempts to convince them to end the hunger strike. Uh, he reportedly drafts a letter of resignation, but never sends it. Now Li Pong holds a televised meeting with student leaders in the Great Hall, but that also leads to no progress. That evening, the party elders and Politburo members meet and approve a declaration of martial law. Uh, Zhao Yu Young does not attend this meeting. And I respect, right, uh, 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 Zhao. Right, he's for sure my favorite CCP party member. May 19, 1989, the student leaders learn about the government's plan to declare martial law. They end their hunger strike and stage now a massive sit-in at the square. Uh, an estimated 1.2 million supporters come out, including police, military, and industrial workers. 1.2 million. How nervous are the CCP now? Zhao Yuyang again comes to the square, accompanied by uh, Li Peng and future premier uh, Wen Jiabao for a final appeal to get the students comp- uh, to compromise. Uh, Zhao reportedly tells the protesters, we have come too late. This was his last public appearance because he was soon removed from office. Oh, you bet your ass he was. He showed weakness regarding communist rule. Pretty hard to be an open-minded and well-liked member of the inner circle of an oppressive regime that continually tramples human rights. Li Peng appeared on TV that evening to declare martial law publicly. Uh, he said, and this is the, the beginning of his public address, Zhao Yu Young is a fucking pussy-ass bitch. Just before I walked in this room, I saw him in the hallway, and I told him to go suck on some nuts. And then he, uh, he asked, what nuts? And I said, these nuts. And I spit in his bitch face. 
Homeboy's soft. He's soft as fuck. And we ain't playing his games anymore. You feel me? We are motherfucking gangsters. And we're about to do some gangster shit up in this bitch. You feel me? You think I'm fucking playing, fool? Try me. That's what I fucking thought. What? What, motherfucker? Step to this. Don't you fucking front on me. Yeah. Yeah, man. Lee Pong went, uh, he went hard. Uh, he did actually go, go hard, but of course not like that. I, I would fucking love that to be true. He actually said uh, the briefing by comrade uh, Li Ximing, secretary of the Beijing Municipal Party Committee, a little while ago indicated that the current situation in the capital is quite grim. The anarchic, the anarchic state is going from bad to worse. Law and discipline have been undermined. Prior to the beginning of May, the situation had begun to cool down as a result of great efforts. However, the situation has become more turbulent since the beginning of May. More and more students and other people have been involved in demonstrations. Many institutions of higher learning have come to a standstill. Traffic jams have taken place everywhere. The party and government leading organs have been affected and public security has been rapidly deteriorating. All this has seriously disturbed and undermined the normal order of production, work, study, and everyday life of the people in the whole municipality. Some activities on the agenda for state affairs of the Sino-Soviet summit that attracted worldwide attention had to be canceled, greatly damaging China's international image and prestige. Oh, the loss of prestige. How dare advocation of basic human rights stand in the way of precious prestige. Uh, The activities of some of the students on hunger strike at Tiananmen Square have not yet been stopped completely. Their health is seriously deteriorating, and some of their lives are still in imminent danger. In fact, a handful of persons are using the hunger strikes as hostages to coerce and force the party and the government to yield to their political demands. In this, reg- in this regard, they have not one iota of humanity. Who are they, how are they being held hostage? Are they holding themselves hostage? That, that's a weird way to frame a hunger, hunger strike. Uh, the party and the government have, on one hand, taken every possible measure to treat and rescue the fasting students. On the other hand, they have held several dialogues with representatives of the fasting students and have earnestly promised to continue to listen to their opinions in the future in the hope that the students would stop their hunger strike immediately. But the dialogues did not yield results as expected. The square is packed with extremely excited crowds who keep shouting uh, demagogic slogans. Right now, representatives of the hunger striking students say that they can no longer control the situation. If we fail to promptly put an end to such a state of affairs and let it go unchecked, It will very likely lead to serious consequences, which none of us want to see. The situation in Beijing is still developing and has already affected many other cities in the country. In many places, the number of demonstrators and protesters is increasing. In some places, there have been incidents of people breaking into local party and government organs, along with beating, smashing, looting, burning, and other undermining activities that seriously violate the law. Some trains running on major railway lines have even been intercepted, causing communications to stop. Something has happened to our trunk line, the Beijing-Guangzhou line. Today, a train from Fizhou was intercepted. The train was unable to move out for several hours. Uh, a lot of these accusations are, uh, are pretty suspect. They're not verified by Western sources. So it's just the communist leadership making these declarations and claims. You know, the same leadership that controls the press, the same leadership that has a propaganda division, uh, the same leadership that constantly suppresses factual information. So who the fuck knows if a lot of this is true? And then he continues, all these incidents demonstrate that we will have nationwide major turmoil if no quick action is taken to turn and stabilize the situation. Our nation's reforms and opening to the outside world, the cause of the four modernizations, and even the fate and future of the People's Republic of China, built by many revolutionary martyrs with their blood, are facing a serious threat. Our party and government have pointed out time and time again that the vast numbers of young students are kind-hearted, that subjectively they do not want turmoil, and that they have fervent, patriotic spirit wishing to push forward reform, develop democracy, and overcome corruption. Okay, well, at least now they're addressing, you know, some truths. Uh, This is also in line with the goals to which the party and government have striven to accomplish. Um, (coughs) Bullshit. (coughs) Bullshit. Uh, No, that's not true. Uh, Should be said that many of the questions and views they raise have already exerted and will continue to exert positive influence on improving the work of the party and government. However, willfully using various forms of demonstrations, boycotts of class, and even hunger strikes to make petitions have damaged social stability and will not be beneficial to solving the problems. Moreover, the situation has developed completely independent of the subjective wishes of the young students. More and more, it is going in a direction that runs counter to their intentions. 
At present, it has become more and more clear that the very, very few people, I love that they keep emphasizing it, the very, very few people who attempt to create turmoil want to achieve. There's like two or three dudes. Uh, under the conditions of turmoil, precisely their political goals, which they could not achieve through normal democratic and legal channels. Ah, they love to use this democratic word. To negate the CPC leadership and to negate the socialist system. They openly promoted the slogan of negating the opposition to bourgeois liberalization. Their goal is to gain absolute freedom, to unscrupulously oppose the four cardinal principles. They spread many rumors, attacking, slandering, and abusing principal leaders of the party and state. How dare they be critical of the government? At present, the spearhead has been focused on comrade Deng Xiaoping, who has made tremendous contributions to our cause of reform and to opening to the outside world. Their goal is precisely to organizationally subvert the CPC leadership, overthrow the people's government elected by the People's Congress in accordance with the law, and totally negate the people's democratic dictatorship. <laughs> I love that propaganda term, democratic dictatorship. That pairing of words makes about as much sense as a cuddly executioner or healthy meth. He now says they stir up trouble everywhere, establish secret ties, instigate the creation of all kinds of illegal organizations and force the party, the people and the government to recognize them. In doing so, they are attempting to lay a foundation and make a breakthrough for the establishment of opposition factions and opposition parties. If they should succeed, the reform and opening to the outside world, democracy and legality and socialist modernization will all come to nothing, and China will suffer a historical retrogression. A very promising China with a very bright future will become a hopeless China with no future. Uh Uh-huh. Fear, fear, fear. If we don't stop them, all your lives are ruined. Now I'm skipping ahead several minutes in the speech towards the end. You know, he and uh, other members just keep repeating all this same fucking propaganda shit we've already gone over. Keep painting protesters as dangerous radicals. And it's only a couple that are really the radicals. The rest are just, you know, being misled by them. You know, these radicals are determined to overthrow the government, to send China into economic free fall and anarchy. And, you know, fucking everything you've ever loved is going to be destroyed. All your lives are going to be ruined. Is there anything corrupt politicians love more than selling fear in order to either get into power, get more power, or keep themselves in power? Uh, and all of this might have led to their regime crashing down, but something so much better could have risen in its ashes. So now the CCP wraps up the speech with to restore normal order, to restore public order, to stabilize the situation in Beijing municipality and to restore normal order. There is, I keep saying normal order over and over. There is no choice, but to remove a group of the PLA to the vicinity of Beijing, right? The people's liberation, liberation army. And then a minute or so later, the arrival of PLA troops in the vicinity of Beijing is definitely not aimed at dealing with students. They have not come here to deal with the students. Their aim is to restore the normal order of production of life, of work in Beijing municipality. At the same time, they aim to protect a number of important departments and major government organs. Therefore, the station of the PLA troops in the capital is aimed at maintaining public security. They are by no means directed at the students. Everyone will be able to clearly see their activities in the next few days. (laughs) <laughs> Everything's okay, everybody. Uh, if there's one thing the army is not in Beijing for, is to hurt anybody. <laughs> now, nah, their guns are just uh, basic, you know, like uh, they're freedom. They're freedom guns. They're democracy guns. Uh, they're definitely not like, uh, you know, pew, pew, die, die guns. Uh, you know, they're they're there to just uh, to help the students come to their senses and just let business as usual kind of move along in a very peaceful, loving way. No, we're not going to hurt anybody. That's the last thing that we want to do. You'll see. May 20th, 1989, PLA soldiers attempt to occupy Beijing for the first time in 40 years of communist rule, and they are met with resistance. Peaceful resistance, but a lot of resistance. Crowds of civilian protesters block their convoys. Protesters begin talking to the soldiers, try to explain why they should leave. Uh, Orville Schell, dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley, who was there in 1989, later told PBS, you had these touching moments of the people appealing to the army to join them. And feeding them and giving them water and saying, you know, could be your son, could be your daughter. And you have these sort of doe-eyed, puzzled soldiers who are mostly country people who weren't experienced with big city life, just wondering what was going on here and not wanting to hurt anybody. And I watched some documentaries and, and saw these soldiers smiling with protesters, gladly accepting their food, laughing, smiling along with singing with them, actually singing protest songs at one point. This was also fucking sad. For a lot of these soldiers, you know, they were being used by party leadership as pawns. You know, I'm sure they were well aware if they resisted orders, they could be executed for being traitors. Uh, And the soldiers were ordered this time 
not to shoot civilians, even if provoked this time. And they were unable to get to uh, Tiananmen Square, like fully into the square, uh, and then also unable to withdraw from the city because of all the roadblocks and such for almost three days. More embarrassment for the party. May 24th, the soldiers, you know, they're able to leave Beijing now. The government views all of this, of, of course, as an embarrassment, another challenge to their authority. According to journalist John Pomfret, the party leaders feared that the whole edifice of communism was going to collapse. They needed to make a stand and a bloody stand to show their population and effect to cow their population back into submission. Exactly. That's what the massacre would be about. Submit. Right. It would not be about protecting anyone other than party leadership. It would be a powerful reminder of you do not fuck with this regime. From May 25th to June 1st, demonstrations continue. According to PBS, Beijing operates with no real police presence and with a virtually free press. And I bet that free press part scared leadership more than the no police part. Protesters at the square were jubilant, according to sources, but the government was fucking furious. Deng Xiaoping now comes up with a new strategy to end the protest. He will send in armed soldiers from every milita- military district in China, according to Oriel Shell. And the second time around, they will bring in troops from far away who don't have connections to Beijing, whose kids are not in the square, and they decide they will brook no obstacle. During the protest, the press starts reporting freely and truthfully. And according to PBS Frontline, the virus of freedom quickly spreads. People in more and more cities are protesting. Protests are occurring in at least 400 cities. Hundreds of thousands of people are in the capital again. The feeling of revolution is in the air. The future of communism in China feels a lot more fragile than it did several months earlier than maybe it ever had since those motherfuckers took over. PBS Frontline later reported in their Tank Man documentary, the students had started the protest hoping to cleanse the party of graft and corruption and encourage free speech. They sought reform, not revolution. After all, they were by and large the children of the elite. But as the movement spread outwards to the middle classes and then to the workers and peasants, attitudes hardened. This is what was uh, this is what scared the government the most, right? Now it's not just students, but the rest of the citizens starting to rebel. If the protests remain limited to the students, they would not represent a sizable enough portion of the population to kick off a true revolution. But if the parents of the students, the friends of the students, the the people the students go to to buy their fucking shit at the markets, they join in, well, now the commies are fucked. Potentially, June second now. Uh, Party elders approved the decision to put down what they call the counter-revolutionary riot at this point and use force if necessary to clear the square. Many hope this will be accomplished without anyone getting hurt, but if need be, they're going to do what they need to do. Demonstrators continue their sit-in. The soldiers return to the square June 3rd. On June 3rd, 1989, word spread that hundreds of thousands of soldiers were coming to the city. There's estimates kind of vary all over the place, but you know, uh, 200,000-ish. Soldiers, residents take to the streets to block them again. They set up barricades with buses, trucks, earth moving equipment, etc., to block the tanks and other military vehicles. And this time it will not be enough. Shit is serious. New orders have been given. 1989, all traffic entering Beijing from the West had to cross the Amushidi Bridge. Senior bureaucrats lived in apartments within view of this bridge. Crowds trying to hold the barricades at the bridge through rocks at the advancing soldiers, right? The bureaucrats are watching this. Armored personnel carriers start to ram into the bus barricades at the bridge. Citizens become aggressive when the army tries to break through their barricades. They shout at soldiers. They start to throw some rocks. One person sets a bus on fire, right? And at this point, the army could have used tear gas, rubber bullets, other uh, anti-riot gear. Uh, They could have assertively ended the riot without killing hundreds, if not thousands of people, but they didn't do that. They used live rounds, lots of them. Soldiers began shooting at the unarmed civilians and students now with fucking AK-47s. Sometime right after 9.30 that night, the first shots are fired. Protesters are surprised. They didn't expect to actually be, you know, machine gunned by the fucking soldiers. However, instead of running away, a lot of people kept coming, right, to stop the soldiers, you know, to to help with the barricades. Soldiers now are shooting in all directions. Some civilians who were standing on their balconies just watching the protests from their fucking homes are shot and killed. Men, women, children, everyone's taking bullets. It's mayhem. And soldiers are using battlefield, battlefield ammunition designed to cause as much injury as possible now. Human rights observer and professor of Chinese history at the University of British Columbia, Timothy Brooke, said the first rounds of fire catch everybody by surprise. The people in the streets do not expect this to happen. Wounded civilians are taken by bicycles and pull carts to local hospitals, but the staff aren't prepared to deal with such severe injuries and so many of them. An unknown number of people are killed at the Mushidi apartments, which had the highest casualties that night. The soldiers were told that the government didn't want any bloodshed, but also ordered to clear the square by 6 a.m. or else. Right. And sending with tanks and guns. So bloodshed clearly 
a real possibility, a likely scenario. By 1 a.m. on June 4th, 1989, an estimated 200,000 PLA soldiers and 100 tanks have reached Tiananmen Square. Uh, by 4 a.m., the student leaders, uh, kind of like the outskirts of the square, uh, by 4 a.m., the student leaders, those who had not already been shot yet, vote to leave or stay. The protests had become a fucking battle. And it wasn't just protesters dying, right? Soldiers are being pulled out of military vehicles, tackled as they march. They're being beaten to death as well. Some of them fucking set on fire. Molotov cocktails are, you know, used. Various thrown projectiles seem to have killed some. Again, John Pomfret, an eyewitness, said, it was clear to me that the stay votes were much, much stronger. But Feng Tung, who was a student leader at the time, said the goes have it, right? We're just uh, seeing the writing on the wall. Feng Tung later told PBS, from my point of view, the important thing was to avoid more injury and death. So I made the decision to lead the students out of the square. Three to 5,000 students and citizens left the square now by the southeast corner. Shots continue to be fired. Some students, right, being beaten to death. Some being ran over by tanks and other military vehicles. Around 4.15 a.m., all the lights go out, plunging protesters into darkness. Author and journalist T.D. Allman tells PBS Frontline, and then I heard these horrible crushing sounds, like when tanks run over things, crushing, splinter sounds, right? That's fucking a lot of people, not just debris being run over. Later that morning, large groups of people start trying to re-enter the square. Many of them are parents of students who spent the night in the square. A lot of them are looking for their children. An officer came out at one point, made the announcement, I'm going to count to five, and then we're going to fire. Soldiers start shooting again, likely killing some of the other people looking for some of the people previously killed. And citizens are scattered, right? Soldiers continue firing at them as they retreat. 40 minutes to an hour later, more people come back, try to get to the square. Soldiers fire at them again. More die. More people flee. This just keeps happening. Happens over half a dozen times. At one point, an ambulance comes in towards the fallen people on the ground and soldiers fire on the ambulance. The square is in complete chaos. Some soldiers are firing at any civilians they see. People are running towards the square, towards soldiers. Other people running away from everything. Both groups are taking bullets. More ambulances come in to try and pick up more injured people. More ambulances get shot at. Uh, smoke and screams of the wounded, the scared, the outraged, the dying fill the air. And an announcement continually warns people towards the uh, you know early morning hours. Under the martial law regulations, no one should be on the street. If you stay on the street, you, uh, you will be responsible for what happens to you. The soldiers uh, shoot rescue workers trying to get wounded people out of the area. Uh, John Giddings from The Guardian in the UK wrote about the shootings on June 3rd and 4th. Uh, the first casualty in the square was rushed away. A girl with her face smashed and bloody carried spread eagle towards the trees. Another followed a youth with a bloody mess around his chest. Another eyewitness said, we took the wounded on stretchers and went down to Tiananmen Square. As we went down the side of the square, we saw soldiers with large plastic bags putting people in these bags. I cannot tell how many people. There were also people surrounded by soldiers being kicked by them. I could hear shouts and the odd gunshot. I thought there were around 200 young people. In early July, I heard from public security sources, the police, that they had all been executed on June 9th in a rural district near Beijing. They included students and residents of Beijing. Uh, by 5.30 a.m. on June 4th, uh, the PLA had accomplished its mission with a half hour to spare. The protests had been completely shut down. The square was cleared. And many other protests around China were also very likely, uh, very likely violently suppressed. By this time, they just didn't have Western journalists to, to document it. Here's another eyewitness account of this uh, Beijing massacre. It comes from Zhang Boli, deputy director of the student hunger strike. Boli spent two years on the run and eventually moved to the U.S. after these protests. Free from worrying about the CCP executing him now, he spoke with BBC's Chinese service about what he witnessed at the square that night. Right? This shit's intense. He said, while we were making preparations, news came from all sides saying that the troops had started to open fire. I remember many students ran to the square with blood running down their faces. In some places, troops were shooting and in some places there were clashes. Zhang Wa had actually been beaten up. When he ran to the square, his face was full of blood. He grabbed the microphone and spoke into it. Fellow students, they have really opened fire now. They are really shooting. They are using their guns and using real bullets. I couldn't believe it. We at the square at the time could not really believe it. There was a speaker's platform under the statue of the goddess of democracy. It was the time when Yen Jia and I had just started to speak that the troops arrived and they were moving into Tiananmen Square. Under the floodlight, I could see all those dark helmets moving like waves into the square towards us. I felt that the final moment must have come. So I spoke to the students, telling them that we should still behave in the spirit we had adopted all along. We will not fight back, even if we are beaten up, and we will not talk back, even if we are cursed upon. We decided to retreat to the Monument of Heroes, to wait there for instructions from our command center. Finally, we reached the monument. Later, Joe Duo 
and Hoda removed their white vests and using them as white flags, they walked over to the troops to negotiate. Negotiate. After all, Hoda was a famous singer of some influence. He couldn't be cast as an anti-revolutionary rebel. When Joe Duo uh, returned, he told the students, they say over there, we'll only give you half an hour to leave to evacuate. If you don't, you will have to bear the consequences. So a very important decision was to be made at that time. What were we going to do with several thousand students here? To leave, to evacuate, or not? Actually, it was quite obvious at the time that it was time that we should leave. So when Feng Tong took over the microphone, he knew that a heavy burden of history was handed to him. Finally, the lights of the square were switched off. When the lights were out, the students thought the troops would start shooting. So many students huddled together. When the lights were out, the microphone was also cut off. Feng Tong then used a loudspeaker to speak to the students, saying, Fellow students, we have two opinions here. One says we should leave now. Another says we should stay put. As I can't see you, please speak aloud to respond. I will first say, we will not leave. If you agree, please say aloud, we agree. Then I will say, we will leave. If you agree, please say, agree. I'll see which response is louder. Actually, it was not easy to tell which response from the crowd was louder. That's crazy that so many people still wanted to stay. Feng Tong quickly made a wise decision because they're unarmed. Uh, he said, I am standing here. This is the highest place. I could hear the response for us to leave was louder. So the command center have now decided we should leave. After we decided that we should leave, they left only a very small gap for us to leave, just about as wide as this room, but nobody dared to move at first. After all, the troops were still in the distance. They had not met us face to face yet. We could only see the helmets. Whoever was first to move and leave might be mistaken by the troops in the distance as a move to challenge them. And if the troops were to fire, those in the front would be the first to be killed, wouldn't they? But there was nothing else the people at the command center could do. So they led the way to leave first. All the people at the command center formed a line. They included students who were protecting the command center. These were students from the Beijing Sports College and were called the pickets. All those in the first three rows to come out were later listed as the most wanted criminals by the Communist Party. I think of the 21 student leaders on the government's most wanted list, four or five were there. When we, the first row of people, came out to meet the troops, our hearts were really jumping and beating hard. The guns of the People's Army were pointing at us, and they were loaded. They were holding machine guns. With one pull of the finger, they could fire on us. Hoda went over to say, Would it be okay for you people to raise your guns a bit higher and point at the sky? It was quite a painful experience. But we came out of the square, and they didn't fire on us. I think that was because they also had to consider the opinions of the people of the nation and of the whole world. If they were rash enough to decide to finish the lot of us on the spot, they could, but it would not do them any good at all. So it was still quite peaceful when we left Tiananmen Square. But then suddenly there was trouble. It was already dawn. A speeding tank came upon us like a gust of wind trying to cut through the lines of people. It was not just trying to run over people. It was also throwing out tear gas. I remember we were all choking and couldn't open our eyes. We just heard the loud rumblings of the tanks. About a dozen meters behind me, people were crying in hysteria. I think more than 12 or 20 odd people were in a mess of blood and flesh. 20 odd people were in a mess. Uh, sorry. And, and it was later said that 11 people were killed there. Uh, the number of deaths in the Tiananmen Square massacre is unknown. The Chinese Red Cross initially purported, purported excuse me, reported, I don't know why I said purported, uh, 2,600 protester deaths, but they retracted that number a whole bunch after being pressured to do so by the government. Uh, the official numbers from the government are 241 deaths, including soldiers and 7,000 wounded. Real number, uh, pretty, assuming strongly, is well over 2,600. Uh, and guessing that, you know, a lot of people disappeared in the following weeks for participating. Some student leaders uh, later claimed that up to 3,400 people were killed. I'll uh, share some uh, later numbers that came out after this was all over uh, here in a while. Uh, the government called a military intervention a victory. An editorial said that the army would punish lawless people who plan riots and disturb social order. The Peking Radio English Language Service stated that thousands of civilians were killed. This government radio called the shootings a gross violation of human rights and a barbarous suppression of the people. CCP authorities would at one point claim that no one was actually killed in the square. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. I've seen video clips uh, that journalists were able to sneak out from the massacre. Definitely people were killed in the square. A lot of dead people in the footage. A lot of gunshots. Uh, by the morning of June 5th, 1989, the army had firmly uh, was firmly controlling the city now. And any other city where there may have been riots, I'm sure they were also controlling. Seemed like the protests were finally over. And for all intents and purposes, they were. But one person was still going to demonstrate a final act of defiance. And that person was, of course, Fighting Man. Fight! 
fight, 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 fight. Fight team commies with his melee sword. Stop being bad guys with his defense shield. Attack roll. 8d4 plus 10, fighting man. Direct hit. Saving throw. 4d6 plus 12, fighting man. The commies miss. They miss the fighting man. Fight, 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 fight. Witch, orc, tank, commie, fight, fight. Kill, kill, kill. And watch out for his companion, Pitbull. Bojangles, Bojangles. Whirlwind attack abilities with his fake leg Gatling gun. 2d10, put the fuck a thousand, motherfucker. All the CCP orcs have been defeated. Time to level up. 10 levels up, a million levels up. Fighting men and Bojangles have gained one trillion experience points and saved China forever. And Bojangles even made top CCP members lick his furry butthole. His butthole, lick his furry butthole. Fight, fight, lick, lick, fight, fight, win, win, buttholes, swords, shields, more, democracy, freedom, fuck those commie motherfuckers. God, that was exciting. Fuck yeah, bro. Noise. Fighting man, Apple Jangles. Unstoppable duo against commies. Uh, but seriously, what happened? Around midday, a group of tanks was traveling along uh, Changon Avenue towards the square. An unarmed young man with two shopping bags in his hand suddenly walks out in the middle of the street, steps out in front of them. They had to have been so shocked. The first tank attempted to move around him, but he kept moving to position himself in front of the tank. The tank attempted to get around him several times, but he just kept moving in front of it until the driver eventually stopped and turned off the motor. Then this unknown young man climbed on top of the tank, talked to the driver, and then jumped back down. Maybe he had lost a friend or family, you know, member the night before to gunfire. Maybe several. Perhaps he wanted answers. Perhaps he just wanted to fucking scream about the injustice of this all. Just when as you watch it, you think he's about to be killed. He is instead grabbed by a few people on the side of the road who run over to him, pull him away to the other side of the street. And then he disappears into the crowd. Maybe forever. To this day, most people think that his identity has never been uncovered and that no one knows what happened to him. He simply became known as Tank Man. Uh, Bruce Hershenson from the Pepperdine from Pepperdine University told PBS Frontline about Tank Man saying he wanted to change China, but what he did was help to change the Soviet Union. I went to a number of countries in Eastern Europe before the Berlin Wall came down and I was complimenting their courage. And they said, if that kid in China stood in front of those tanks, we can do what we're doing. What this young man did was, in effect, change the world. Hail fucking Nimrod. Well, Jangle just stood up on uh, his two hind legs and applauded Tank Man's courage. Not the outcome Tank Man hoped for, I'm sure, but a very important outcome nonetheless. I'm sure he you know, would have preferred that change to start happening in China. Uh, Charlie Cole, a photographer who witnessed Tank Man's actions, believes that the people who moved Tank Man away were plainclothed Public Bureau of Security officers because they were monitoring the outer areas of the square. To him, it seemed like they had snatched teams of people down below. He thinks the Tank Man was executed. And I hope he's wrong. But I mean, I'm guessing Charlie might know a little bit more about the situation than I do. Uh, he told PBS Frontline, we saw a lot of public executions put on Chinese TV shortly after that. My God. And it was four people that had done far less than embarrass the government in such a way. Tens of thousands of people were arrested after the massacre. An unknown number of them were executed. And yeah, many publicly. If China did execute Tank Man, uh, they didn't say it was him that we know of. Some people believe that it was helpful citizens, though who helped get him off the road and the tank man managed to escape arrest or execution and just never come forward. I hope they are right. Hail tank man. And possibly this many years later, you know, rest in peace. Uh, three weeks after the massacre, an English Sunday newspaper did name tank man claiming that he was Wang Wei, a 19 year old son of a Beijing factory worker. And the Sunday express reported that Wei was arrested for political hool hooliganism. But a lot of other outlets seem to doubt the claims of the express. Uh, China has refused to confirm Tank Man's identity or whereabouts. They claim that they've never been able to find him. And I'm sure that they would, uh, you know, say that if they did find him and secretly killed him. Uh, journalist Alfred Lee said that friends of Wong claimed that they saw him with his head shaved and paraded around on state TV later. Uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher congratulated Alfred Lee on his discovery. Alfred Lee told PBS, I published the name Wong Wei after speaking to three excellent contacts that I had in Beijing. These contacts were very close to what was happening in Tiananmen Square at the time. I knew that once his name had come into the public domain, the Chinese authorities 
wouldn't be able to do anything to him. I don't know if that's true. Uh, they couldn't. They couldn't execute him. It would have brought outrage from the world. Yeah, but did they really care? Uh, but again, Chinese journalists and many Western journalists very skeptical about this story. Five days later, the London Evening Standard cited American intelligence reports supposedly confirming that Wang Wei was dead. Uh, the article was attributed to Beijing correspondent John Passmore, but then Passmore told Frontline that he does not remember that article and he didn't write it because he didn't have American intelligence sources. He said he didn't know Wang Wei or what happened to him. When the interviewer asked him if it was normal for reports to be attributed to journalists who didn't write them, Passmore answered, oh, absolutely. It looks so much better if you've got a man out in Beijing and he's written this report, but the report may have come from anywhere. Sometimes it's done out there. Sometimes it's done in the office. In 1990, uh, Zhang Zumin, future president of China, was asked by Barbara Walters what happened to Tank Man. And uh, he answered, I think this young man may be not killed by the tank. Walters said, no, but did you arrest him? We heard he was arrested and executed. And uh, Zemin uh, said, uh, well, I can't confirm whether this young man you mentioned was arrested. Oops, excuse me, arrested or not. Walters said, you do not know what happened to him? And Zumin said, but I think never, never killed. And then Walter started to say something else. He's like, bitch, shut the fuck up. You know who I am? You don't fucking question me. No, uh, he, he just never said. This was the last official statement on the subject. And I don't think we learned anything from it. June 9th, 1989, uh, Dong Xiaoping appears for the first time since the declaration of martial law. He praises military officers and blames the chaos on counter-revolutionaries who wanted to overthrow communism. After the protests, the authorities started to search for people involved in the demonstrations. Thousands are detained, tortured, imprisoned. Who knows how many executed after being charged with various counter-revolutionary crimes. The Chinese authorities have never given an official number to how many people were detained, tried, or executed since, uh, you know, around this uh, June 1989. Uh, the relatives of the people who were shot were not allowed to seek any form of justice and are not able to openly mourn family members even. I did read some stories that for years in communist China, if uh, your relative was executed by the state, you also had to pay for the fucking bullets used to kill them. And that's dark. Uh, June 13th, 1989, the Beijing police issued a most wanted notice for 21 student leaders. Um, some of them had already fled to, a uh, handful of them fled to, fled to uh, the West via Hong Kong. Most were still in the country and supposedly 14 were arrested. Number one on the list, 21 or 20 year old Wang Don who would be sentenced to four years in prison where he was seriously re-educated and he hasn't protested shit since that that I'm aware of. Uh, another six, about 1,600 people were arrested according to National Geographic. However, History.com reports that up to 10,000 people were arrested. Just over six years ago, October 15, 2016, China released the last protester in prison that we know of from the Tiananmen Square protests. Then 51-year-old Miao Doshuen, who had served 27 years in prison, Miao was accused of arson after he threw a basket at a burning tank. According to Simon Denyer from the Washington Post, uh, Deshuen suffered from hepatitis B and was very mentally ill from all of his re-education by the time he was released. He had been tortured for God knows how long because he consistently refused to admit guilt. Leaders around the world condemned China after the Tiananmen Square massacre. President Bush denounced the soldiers' actions in the square. He suspended military sales, right? Placed an embargo on weapon sales and high-level exchanges stopped with Chinese officials. Uh, Zhao Yuyang, the one CCP official who seemed to have really tried to help avoid bloodshed, he would die January 17th, 2005. And he lived the last 15 years of his life since the protests under house arrest, punished for advocating reason and empathy and dialogue. He eventually came to hold a number of beliefs that were much more radical than any positions he had ever expressed while in power. He came to believe that China should adopt a free press, freedom of, freedom of assembly, an independent judiciary, and a multi-party parliamentary democracy. And hail Zhao Yuyang. Rest in peace. Bojangle salutes you. Zhao tried. He actually tried to do the right thing and paid for it. His memoir was published posthumously or posthumously. Ha ha. I think I caught myself on that one. Uh, 2009, uh, titled Prisoner of the State, The Secret Journal of Zhao Yuyang. This 306-page book was crafted over four years from tapes recorded in secret by Zhao while under house arrest and then smuggled out to Hong Kong by some of his friends. In the book, Zhao praises the Western system of parliamentary democracy and says it is the only way China can solve its problems of corruption and a growing gap between the rich and the poor. It wasn't until 2019 that Zhao's ashes would be interred with his wife, after his cremation ceremony, party officials initially refused 
permission for his ashes to be buried. Normally, funerals for state leaders and officials are extravagant affairs. However, there were no speeches and editorials after Zhao's death. He was categorized as a toppled former leader, and his death anniversaries were smothered in deliberate silence and tightened security. They didn't want him to become a symbol for a revolution. In December of 2017, news outlets across the world reported on an updated death count taken from declassified documents in the UK National Archives. These are numbers I re- was referring to earlier. Alan Donald, a British ambassador, sent telegrams to the Foreign Office on June 5th. Donald said his source was someone who was passing on information given him by a close friend who is currently a member of the state council. He said that his source was reliable and careful to separate fact from speculation and rumor. The documents were held in the UK National Archives, then declassified October 2017. And as mentioned previously, early on June uh, 4th, the Red Cross uh, Society of China estimated that 2,700 people died. Then the mayor of Beijing, uh, Chen Shitong, said that only around 200 people died. <laughs> you did the math wrong. Uh, you say 2,700? No, but let's, let's try 200. And including 36 university students and that roughly 3,000 civilians were injured. But citing declassified files, the 2017 leak estimated that 10,454 people were killed and around 40,000 more injured. Wow. And again, their sources were uh, internal files from the Chinese government headquarters passed to Americans via sources in the martial law troops. Or maybe I didn't say that earlier, that source part. But over 10,000 protesters butchered, right, that one night, just in Beijing, another 40,000 injured. My God. Alan Donald, that British ambassador, also said his source uh, um, said that the commander of the army that massacred protesters was Yong Jenhua, nephew of President Yong Shangquen. And Donald wrote, the 27 army was kept without news for 10 days and told they were to take part in an exercise. A TV film would be made of the exercise, which pleased them. The document said that the clearance operation for June 3rd had four stages with another troop from Shenyang military region, but the demonstrators managed to stop the first three attacks. 27 army APCs, armored personnel carriers, opened fire on the crowd, both civilian and soldiers, before running them in the APCs, because there was soldiers protesting as well just not necessarily armed. Uh, The document also said that SMR soldiers separated the students from residents. Students understood they were given one hour to leave the square, but after five minutes, APCs attacked. Students linked arms and then were mowed down down, uh, by the the shooters. APCs then ran over bodies time and time again to make, (sighs) it's kind of some weird translation, to make pie, okay? And remains collected by bulldozer, remains incinerated and then hosed down drains. Yeek. 27 Army ordered to spare, and these, uh, again, this is this translated to classified documents. 27 Army ordered to spare no one, shot wounded SMR soldiers, four wounded girl students begged for their lives, but were bayoneted. Three-year-old girl was injured, but her mother was then shot as she went to her aid, as were six others who tried. A thousand survivors were told they could escape via uh, Yonggi Lu, but were then mowed down by specially prepared MG positions. Army ambulances who attempted to give aid were shot up as was Sino-Japanese hos- a Sino-Japanese hospital ambulance with medical crew dead. Wounded driver attempted to ram attackers but was blown to pieces with an anti-tank weapon. In a further attack, APCs caught up with SMR straggler trucks, rammed and overturned them and ran over troops. During an attack, 27 Army officer uh, shot dead by own troops apparently because he faltered. Troops explained that they would be shot if they hadn't shot officer. Fuck. Donald reported that the soldiers were using an expanding bullet that was prohibited for use in war by international law. He said 27 Army were using dumb, dumb bullets. 27 Army snipers shot many civilians on balconies, street sweepers, etc. for target practice. Beijing hospitals had been also ordered to accept only security force casualties. Man, shooting citizens for target practice and even more cruel, ordering local hospitals do not treat wounded protesters. Uh, Donald gave further information from a source claiming that they had some members of the state council claiming that some members of the state council considered that civil war was imminent. Another document claimed that the Chinese military of defense invited military attaches to to China for a July 28th session and explained what happened on June 4th. But U.S. and French attaches were not invited and Japan declined. So only Canada and Britain attended the briefing. Li Ji-yoon, political chief of the 38th Army said that the army didn't shoot anyone and that stray bullets killed 200 people. He said, if more than 200 can be killed in a single aircraft crash, how can anybody claim that the PLA massacred the people? In any case, most of the dead were rioters trying to overthrow the government. Uh, what? Not sure how uh, the aircraft analogy here is supposed to relate to the massacre. No, man, we didn't massacre anyone. People people just die. 
Sometimes in a plane crash. Sometimes because of a couple stray bullets. You know, that's life. Uh, he also claimed that the fires were caused by illegal unions burning documents uh, down in the square, that young soldiers were just burning trash on the square. Nobody was killed or wounded on Tiananmen. Nobody in China can come out and testify that people were killed on Tiananmen. Okay. Document also reported that Lee mocked Tank Man, saying, look at this man's so-called bravery. All right. Time Magazine would report that uh, on June 2nd, 2019, almost 30 years after the Tiananmen Square Massacre, that Chinese uh, China's defense minister, Wei Feng Ha, called the Tiananmen Square protests political turmoil that the central government needed to quell, which was the correct policy. Because of the government's actions, China has enjoyed stability. And if you visit China, you can understand this part of our history. <laughs> I love that. Just come over here. I know it's confusing when you hear it from afar. Just come over here. Let us explain it to you in person. We will make sure that you fucking get it. We have the best re-education clockwork orange style of teaching. Uh, Time writes that the Chinese government still keeps a tight grip when it comes to information about the uh, protests. People who use social media in China have to create accounts using their real names. So if you talk shit, they're going to know it was you. And someone will show up at your house and you will fucking regret it. The government also uses censorship tools, other ones to erase certain politically sensitive search terms or redirect users to different topics. Even online video recognition software detects images related to Tiananmen Square or to the history of the incident and scrubs it. Time uh, writes, 30 years after the murders in Tiananmen Square, China presents a contradictory legacy. Its leadership has provided opportunities for a better life to a larger number of people than any government in history. And China remains a police state where citizens can't publicly acknowledge that this mass murder ever took place. And that combo is so fucking weird. How much is it worth to have a better chance at middle-class comforts? Is it worth your freedom? Is it worth your soul? Uh, Li Peng died of an unspecified illness July 22nd, 2019. Uh, before he died, he earned himself the nickname the Butcher of Beijing, amongst many. These diary entries were published in 2010 where he attempted to downplay his role and claimed he was following Deng's orders with the massacre. But the Communist Party documents, a.k.a. the Tiananmen Papers, suggest he actually led the Tiananmen crackdown. Lee tried to argue that his actions were backed by the elders and that Deng gave his firm and full support to put down the political disturbance using forceful measures. And that will take us out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Uh, so now let's talk a bit about what followed the massacre in China. Afterwards, there was a brief period of hope that some real change would occur. Chinese novelist Ma Jian, uh, who was there in 1989, recalled, There was a euphoric sense that after decades of tyranny, the Chinese people had found the courage to take full control of their lives and attempt to change the fate of their nation. Every person in that crowd was later a victim of the massacre. Whether they lost their life on June 4 or survived, their ideals shattered and their souls scarred by fear. Ugh. After the massacre, uh, Deng Xiaoping focused on building up China's economy. Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley, Orville Schell, we've heard from him before, said this was Deng Xiaoping's great moment of genius. After the massacre, he in effect said, we will not stop economic reform. We will, in effect, halt political reform. What he basically said to people was, folks, you're in a room. There are two doors. One door says politics. One door says economics. You open the economic door, you're on your own. You can go the full distance, do basically basically whatever you want. Get wealthy, help your family, have a bright future, move forward into a glorious future. If you open the political door, you're going to run right into one obstruction after another, and you're going to run into the state. And that's what China has today, right? A fair amount of economic freedom, the ability to build great wealth. But even with great wealth in China, you still have very little political freedom. The state owns the land beneath your home and business. You, can, you, you can't openly criticize the state without retribution, without you know, great risk of retribution. And you can still be sent off to a uh, you know, re-education camp without a trial, which happens often. Deng's economic reforms were meant to buy the Communist Party a new lease on life. It would help the people, but at the same time, they could not push for political reform or challenge the party in any way. And this policy has worked economically. China's uh, economy has grown rapidly. Time Magazine wrote, to survive the upheaval, its leadership rewrote their social contract. The post-Maoist effort of reform and opening up whereby China established its own brand of market economy socialism was ultimately accelerated, but at the expense of political reforms. 
By some measures, the trade-off was extremely successful. At the time of the Tiananmen rallies, China's GDP per capita compared unfavorably to Gambia's. By 2030, if not before, many indicators predict China's economy will eclipse the U.S. PBS Frontline reported in their 2006 Tank Man documentary, never in the course of human history has a larger number of people gained more wealth in such a short time. Since 1989, China has seen the emergence of a new middle class estimated at over 200 million people. This particular social contract, right, economic reform in exchange for forgetting about Tiananmen Square and maintaining the power of the party, has mainly, though, uh, benefited the upper and middle classes. When state-owned industries were overtaken by Western companies, 30 million people working the lower class lost their jobs. According to Nicholas Bequillen from Human Rights Watch, this led to the development of two Chinas, which we have today, China A and China B. China A is the big cities with businessmen and foreign governments. Uh, you know, uh, people from foreign governments, they face urban problems that many developed countries face like urbanization, traffic, crime, education, and health, but they're doing very well financially. China B is the majority of the country and they live outside the cities, out in the country and deal with a lot of poverty. Not nearly as much extreme poverty as they used to overall, but they still deal with a lot and deal with a, you know, lack of economic opportunities because of all the, all the opportunities are in the cities. They suffer from a lack of education, lack of clean drinking water in many cases, lack of basic economic resources, infrastructure, etc. And many factory workers who contributed to China's great economic success are currently suffering, working long hours for extremely low pay in filthy and dangerous conditions. Young women make up a large number of these workers. Are They're wanted for their energy and speed. Many people travel from rural provinces to the cities for factory jobs and then send home money to their families before these factories just kind of fucking break down their bodies. A lot of them live in crowded dorms and work long hours. But overall, the economy is up. Uh, up to a point that historically leads to more political freedom. In most cases, Time reported that several years ago, China leapfrogged what is called the political transition zone. I did not know about this. This, uh, this is levels of income that generally show when uh, authoritarian states begin to transition to democracy. Democratic transition becomes historically much more likely above $1,000 per capita and uh, more likely than that, above $4,000 per capita. And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, reported that in 2018, China reached almost $10,000 per capita. China's economic success, since it is, uh, uh, you know, the success it's had so far, though, has not led to democracy which intimidates Western countries. Per Time Magazine, beyond simply eschewing democracy, Beijing increasingly poses an authoritarian foil to Western liberalism, acting as a lodestar for developing nations that similarly seek to divorce economic reforms from political concessions. Chinese President Xi Jinping, uh, excuse me, Xi Jinping, announced in 2017 uh, a new option for other countries and nations who want to speed up their development while preserving their independence. However, according to Andrew Nathan, political science professor at Columbia, China might still yet become what Tiananmen Square protesters were hoping for. He says that, yeah, the Chinese government is strong, but the people's loyalty is based on growing wealth. And due to economic troubles, pollution, and corruption, there are some doubts or anxieties about Xi Jinping's ability to continue fulfilling the pro prosperity for loyalty bargain that they have. Nathan told Time, attitudes are changing. It's a close race between the human desire for freedom and the state's capacity for control. So hopefully the uh, human desire for freedom wins out in the coming years. But currently China still has a long way to go. China is so powerful that many other countries are very reluctant to speak out against its human rights violations. For example, in the province of Xinjiang, the world's largest incarceration of an ethnic minority population is currently occurring. One to two million ethnic uh, Uyghur and Muslim people are being detained in concentration camps called re-education again centers. Right? What are they doing there? Well, according to information leaked from the Communist Youth League in uh, uh, Xinjiang in March of 2017, that branch, the training has only one purpose, to learn laws and regulations, to eradicate from the mind thoughts about religious extremism and violent terrorism, and to cure ideological diseases. Ha! Any thought uh, uh, against uh, you know supporting the state is an ideological disease. If the education is not going well, we will continue to provide free education until the students achieve satisfactory results and graduate smoothly. <laughs> they make it sound so nice. If the brainwashing doesn't work at first, free of charge, uh, we will continue to, you know, torture the fuck out of these people until they get it. Assimilate or die. <laughs> uh, freedom. Yeah, still has so far to go in China to catch up with what we have in the West. 
to a level like uh, that that the protesters were hoping for. Public discussion of the Tiananmen Square massacre is still not allowed in China. Many people have been imprisoned for commemoration of the massacre or questioning the government's official conclusions about the massacre. In December of 2021, a famous statue at the University of Hong Kong marking the Tiananmen Square massacre was removed. One of the last memorials in Hong Kong regarding the incident. Poor Hong Kong, uh, reclaimed by communist China, China in 1997 uh, from British rule. The... Uh, the Chinese government regularly puts intellectuals, writers, and activists under house arrest before the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Just make sure they uh, don't say shit. The protest slash massacre also censored from textbooks, as I said, the Chinese internet, the Chinese government continually rejects public calls for political liberalization, uh, has increased suppression of dissent since 1989 to, so they say, maintain stability. The government has justified their actions as necessary for continued economic prosperity. Uh, according to PBS Frontline, the image of Tank Man was televised in China on China television, but just once in 1989, rebranded as an example of the army's restraint and tolerance. An English translation of the footage stated, anyone with common sense can see that if our tanks were determined to move on, this lone scoundrel, I love that they say scoundrel, this scoundrel, this scallywag, uh, could never have stopped them. The scene flies in the face of Western propaganda. It proves that our soldiers exercise the highest degree of restraint. Outside of China, if you search Tiananmen Square, you'll see thousands of photos of Tank Man standing in front of that line of tanks. But when people in China make the uh, same search, they only get a few pages of results and none of the images are of Tank Man. Just uh, random pics of dudes and tanks. June of 2022, uh, Human Rights Watch announced Chinese authorities have over the past year stepped up the harassment and persecution of activists for commemorating the June 4th, 1989 massacre. According to Human Rights Watch, over the past year, uh, 26 pro-democracy activists have been arrested for inciting others to participate in vigils. Some received suspended sentences or prison sentences uh, of four to 14 months. January of 22, Chinese human rights lawyer uh, Chao Yongtong uh, was sentenced to 15 months in prison for participating and inciting people to participate in a 2021 vigil. Chao was already serving a 12-month sentence for participating in a 2020 vigil. Chao uh, was vice chairman chairwoman, excuse me, for, excuse me, for the uh, Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movement of China. In the weeks before the anniversary, the authorities restricted the movement and communications of different activist groups and individuals. Other activists were imprisoned for charges such as picking quarrels and provoking trouble. What a fucking charge. What a shit government. Uh, what were you charged with? Provoking trouble. What kind of trouble? Just trouble. We don't allow trouble. We don't like quarreling and we definitely don't like trouble. Uh, there were also charges as uh, holding a single man protest in commemoration of the massacre. <laughs> you can't even hold a solo protest. March 22, the U.S. Department of Justice revealed that five agents of the Chinese government had stalked and harassed U.S. based critics, including a former student leader in Tiananmen Square, now 58 year old uh, Xiong Yen, who made it to the U.S. as a political refugee in 1992, joined the army, fought in Iraq with U.S. forces, achieved the rank of major. Hail Xiong Yen. Dude even recently ran for the House of Representatives in New York. Didn't win, but he ran. And China still fucking with him about telling the truth about Tiananmen Square. Their government is fucking insane. Uh, I hope you liked this week's episode. I really did. It was a challenge for me. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of different words. Uh, but thanks for the challenge, Space Lizards. Our Patreon inner circle here in the Suckverse who guide uh, us to two different topics a month. It was a good challenge. This episode reminded me of how valuable our right to a peaceful demonstration is, to protest is in this country. We should all support that right, even when the people are protesting, protesting shit we do not agree with. Right? It makes me think about the Westboro Baptist Church. I'm disgusted when they protest veteran funerals and mock them. I'm also disgusted when I see uh, old men with no skin in the game protesting young women and girls going to abortion clinics. But I am so glad that they're able to do that. Right? And they should always be able to do that. Such a great reminder of how free we are. Doesn't make any sense to only support protests when they're protesting a cause that you agree with. Right? This episode also reminds me why it is important to get worked up about politics from time to time, get involved, pick a side when you got to. I think a lot of people get themselves too worked up uh, over media pundits and fear mongerers, uh, you know, selling us false alarms, getting us uh, worked up over a bunch of bullshit, a bunch of nothing. But sometimes when our freedoms and human rights are truly threatened, we should get worked up. For example, should we, uh, you know, shit on all police when some bad cops kill an innocent citizen over fucking nothing? No, that's uh, that's not uh, uh, rational. That's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But it is rational to be enraged over what some assholes, uh, you know, did when they did abuse their power. It is rational to bring awareness 
you know, to the uh, rights of a fellow citizen being trampled when they're murdered by an agent of the state. Thank God we can protest when shit like that happens. You know, we can uh, protest, uh, you know, over, uh, you know, not having to take a shot to keep our jobs. We should be able to protest that as well. We should be able to protest whatever the fuck we want to protest. And when we witness a protest we don't agree with, we should rejoice. Be glad that the next time around, maybe we'll be the one able to make our voice heard and not have to worry about the military sending in fucking tanks to run us over and literally gunning us down on the street. America has problems. Every nation has problems, you know? America, of course, has problems. It's a big, big ass melting pot. Has a massive, unruly economy. A lot of different opinions trying to be catered to by just one government. There's always going to be a, a bit of a mess in that regard. But holy fuck, do we have it a lot better than China has it. Imagine going to jail for doing something like holding a vigil uh, for the memory of Martin Luther King or for the victims of U.S. internment camps for Japanese citizens. Imagine not being allowed to post a pic of your grandpa on Instagram who was sent to one of those camps during World War II. You know, or imagine if George Floyd was your uncle and you would go to jail for talking about how he died publicly or for posting something online about it. That is China. That is daily life there for almost a billion and a half people right now. Man, fuck their communist bullshit government. Give me freedom. Even if it means less state economic support, still give me freedom. So important to me to be able to say what I want to say, right? I make a living saying shit that would get me imprisoned and re-educated in China on a weekly basis. And you should want me to be able to say whatever the fuck I want to say too, especially when you don't agree with it, when you find it heinous. If the state starts to censor me, it's only a matter of time before they start to censor your ass as well. Shit like this is what will always scare me about big government, man. Stick to the basics, Uncle Sam. Basic infrastructure, basic safety law, uh, strong military to keep our freedoms protected, basic education. And after that, for the most part, you can basically go fuck yourself and keep any censorship or any NSA tentacles out of my shit. Uh, One last stop before uh, today's takeaways. Uh, For the past three years, a yearly candlelight vigil honoring the victims of the Tiananmen Square massacre has been banned in Hong Kong. Uh, One of the only places where such vigils were allowed in uh, recent memory in uh, China. But despite the ban, thousands of people have still gathered in 2020, 2021, and 2022 to honor the victims. Despite several activists being arrested every year, more vigils will likely be held in 2023 and beyond. A lot of brave people over there still trying, still trying to keep the memory of Tiananmen Square uh, alive in China. How fucking noble. Still risking arrest and torturous re-education for just openly wanting what many of us listening to this podcast take for granted every single day. The right to disagree, the right to demand reform. How lucky are those of us who live in countries where we have these rights? Well, Jangle just gave me a thumbs up and nodded. He gets it. I get it. Feeling very thankful to live where I live after hearing a story like today's. I lucked out in the meat sack birth lotto. Now let's hit those takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. I'm to rehash four things we already learned and learn one more uh, something new. Number one, the Tiananmen Square protest started with students mourning the death of Chinese politician Hu Yaobang, who died on April 15th, 1989. The students used Hu's legacy to call for reforms and thousands of students gathered at Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Soon there were tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of protesters, including ordinary Beijing citizens. The government feared that the protesters wanted to overthrow the party and there was much internal debate over how to end the protests. Number two, party general secretary uh, Zhao Yuyang supported the student protesters, calling them patriotic, urging his fellow politicians to listen to their demands. However, party premier Li Peng wanted to end the protests as quickly as possible, did not want to engage in dialogue with the students. Then when a state newspaper published an editorial criticizing the students and threatening punishment, calling them traitors, more protests broke out outside Beijing, intensifying the party debate between those like Li Peng, who wanted to squash the rebellion by any means necessary, and those like Zhao Yuyang, who wanted to talk and negotiate. In the end, Li Peng and those who thought like him, sadly, had their way. China might look very differently today in the best of ways if they'd lost that argument. Number three, no one knows exactly how many people died or were injured during the Tiananmen Square massacre. The Chinese government still reports 241 dead, around 7,000 injured. Initially, the Red Cross Society of China reported 2,700 deaths, but retracted that number after receiving government pressure to do so. Then in 2017, documents were unsealed from the UK National Archives that put the number of dead above 10,000 with another roughly 40,000 injured. These documents further detail the brutality committed by the Chinese army against its own civilians. Number four, on June 5th, 1989, a man stood in front of a line of tanks in a final act of defiance the day after the massacre. Right? Fighting men! 
fight, 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 fighting man and Bojangles, fucking shit up. No, it's Tank Man. Uh, a real fighting man, real life fighting man in a way. Uh, the tanks attempted to go around him, but risking death, he refused to get out of their way. Eventually, the man climbed on top of a tank, spoke to the driver, and was then whisked away by an unknown group of people. To this day, no one knows who he is or what happened to him. He's known as Tank Man, and he has served as an important symbol for protesters and revolutionaries around the world, such as people who, you know, helped bring down the Soviet Union. And number five, new info. The rest of the world learned about the Tiananmen Square massacre because of some smuggled photos and videos. Let me explore this uh, a bit more. Some Western journalists were staying at a hotel in Beijing with a view of Chungan Avenue, which runs into the square. Reporters and photographers stood on their balconies or oftentimes laid down and hit on those balconies to avoid gunfire and to record the action of the massacre. And some witnessed Tank Man the next day. Journalist Jane Wong told PBS Frontline how she reacted when she saw him run out in front of the tank. She said, I started to cry because I had seen so much shooting and so many people dying. I was sure this man would get crushed. Charles Cole, photojournalist for Newsweek, said, during this time, I'm thinking this guy's going to be killed any moment now. And if he is, I, it's, I just can't miss this. This is something that he's giving his life for. It is my responsibility to record it as accurately as possible. Charles captured one of the world's most famous images, the young man bravely standing right in front of a tank. Charles then saw some public security bureau agents, the police, right? Public security bureau here, uh, watching him from another rooftop. Uh, He went inside, took the film out of his camera, put it in a plastic film can, and then hid that inside the toilet's holding tank. He said that about 50 minutes later, some other public security bureau agents came to his hotel room, took one roll of film of shots uh, from the previous night, right? Where they were just going to confiscate and destroy them. In his words, they were pretty satisfied. They'd cleaned up the situation. After the PSB took Cole's roll of film, he was forced to sign a confession that he was photographing during martial law and he had his passport confiscated. Day and a half later, after he gets things squared around and can return home, he goes back to the hotel and sees that no one has, thank God, flushed the toilet. And the film is still there, uh, floating there in the water. Cole then had the film developed at the AP office in Beijing, secretly had it sent to Newsweek and won the 1990 World Press Photo of the Year. Uh, Jeff Widener, a photographer located in Hamburg, Germany, also captured an iconic Tank Man photo. He was an AP photographer at the time, and he was actually annoyed that someone stepped into his shot of the approaching tanks. Uh, Turned out to be Tank Man. Uh, Widener said that he had been in Beijing for the past week, was injured during the massacre, saying, I was hit in the head by a protester's rock early the morning of June 4th. I was also suffering from the flu, so I was quite ill and injured when when I photographed Tank Man from the sixth floor balcony of the Beijing hotel. American, American exchange student Kirk Martson helped Widener sneak into the hotel where he had the best view of the square. The government was trying to control how news got out. And a few days before the crackdown of the square, China tried to stop all American news outlets from broadcasting in Beijing. Widener said that there was a big risk of being arrested and having your film confiscated. So Kirk Martson put Widener's film in his underwear and smuggled it out of the hotel, right? And then eventually the pictures are you know, seen worldwide and Jeff's photo is nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He said, though I knew the picture was highly acclaimed, it wasn't until years later when I saw an AOL post where my image was named one of the top 10 most memorable photos of all time. That was the first time that I realized I'd accomplished something extraordinary. Man, so much respect to the journalists and others who risked arrests, who knows what else, you know, uh, to get the truth out. Hope that someday soon China's communist rule will come to an end and these pictures and the story can be shared with the people who deserve to see the pics and hear about all this the most. The people who actually live in China. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Tiananmen Square massacre and protests have been sucked. Praise Bojangles. He gave me a lot of moral support this suck. Uh, thank you to Bad Magic Productions, uh, the team here, for helping make Time Suck. Thanks once again to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for producing and directing today. And to the Art Warlock, Logan Keith, for helping with production. Thanks also to Bitelixer for upkeep on the Time Suck app. The Art Warlock, uh, again, for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com and helping run our socials with the Suck Ranger and a team managed by our social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for the initial research this week. And thank you, Olivia, for finding a great pronunciation guide for Chinese words, names specifically. Also, thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, making sure Discord keeps running smooth. Met a lot of uh, the uh, Discord people lately, and they are fucking awesome. And everyone over uh, on the Time Suck subreddit and the Bad Magic subreddit. So many fantastic sacks. Doing a lot for this community. Uh, just heard about uh, more sacks building uh, great relationships, great friendships, and some recent meet and greets. Uh, next week on Time Suck, 
uh, we go deep in the history of true crime to a case of two young men from Chicago, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. Leopold and Loeb, who thought they had come up with the perfect crime in the spring of 1924, something that would never be attributed to them, something that would confuse the fuck out of investigators and the world at large, something that would be written about in the papers for years to come. And it would be written about, uh, um, yeah, these teenage boys, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, would shortly be discovered as the murderers of 14-year-old Bobby Franks. To many, this crime was just so senseless. Richard and Nathan had, uh, and yes, I do love that we got a fucking dick in here at the end. Uh, Richard and Nathan had everything uh, going for them. They'd both graduated college as young teens, 14 and 15, and were getting advanced degrees. They were uh, smart, came from wealthy, well-connected families. Even if they'd never gotten any professional success, they were sure to live a life of luxury and ease, but that would not happen. They would go to prison. After Nathan Leopold became convinced that through a misreading of philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, both pronunciations are acceptable, uh, he and Loeb were uh, Nietzsche's supermen. He thought a class of superior people who could do whatever they wanted didn't have to follow society's rules. Wrapped up in their delusion, pushed on by each other, much like murderous couple Fred and Rose West, they soon formulated a complicated plan that would end in the murder of Loeb's 14-year-old second cousin. A murder they thought was the perfect crime. And they might have gotten away with it if uh, Nathan Leopold hadn't dropped a pair of very special eyeglasses near the site where they dumped Bobby's body. How did they come up with this plan? Is there any such thing as the perfect crime? And what insane theory did the 1920s media come up with to explain this senseless murder? All of that next week on Time Suck. And right now, let's head on to a very entertaining edition of uh, some Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. A bunch of silly, lighthearted updates this week that I just found very entertaining. Starting with uh, Space Eater Zach, Rebecca Malsh, who got got. Rebecca writes, well, Dan, you got me. After being a loyal space lizard for the past several years, I never thought that I would fall prey to Cummins Law, but I guess you can't outrun fate. Uh, I was listening to the latest episode on Patrick Kearney while driving to work, and I finished the episode right as I pulled up to the office. Because of past victims, I always make sure to hit pause or stop on the app and then clear the app from my phone before opening my car door to make sure the app doesn't start randomly playing again. As I was leaving for lunch today, I got into my car while on the phone, and my Bluetooth picked up. No big deal, right? Wrong. As I approached the drive through to order, I quickly hung up. And as they said, welcome to Smoothie King. What can I get you? Time Suck resumed playing at top volume with you saying, do you think he ate out the dog's butthole? Followed closely by, yep, yeah, he tossed his fucking salad. I'm frantically trying to pause the app and turn down the volume at the same time as the girl goes, what was that? But you just kept blasting through the speakers now saying, that's right, he tossed his furry salad. I <laughs> I finally was able to pause the app, praying that the girl did not hear a word of what just happened. Meekly ordered my smoothie and pulled forward. <laughs> I wanted a strawberry smoothie. Uh, based on the look on her face when I pulled up, she definitely heard. I shamefully took my smoothie, drove away. I don't think I'll be able to show my face at that smoothie king for quite some time. If you can, please give a shout out to my husband, Brad. He is an amazing partner and a wonderful dad. We both listen to Time Suck and getting a shout out would mean a lot to him. Thanks for all you do and keep on sucking. Just maybe not in hairy dog buttholes. I don't think Bojangles would like that, Rebecca. <laughs> well, thank you for the laughs, Rebecca. I think you should go back to that Smoothie King ASAP. And this time, I think you should be dressed up in some kind of uh, puppy play outfit and listen to hardcore dog-centric sex talk. Really double down on being super into furry buttholes. And also, hi, Brad. Uh, thanks for being an amazing partner, wonderful dad. Uh, yay, amazing partners and fathers. Hail Nimrod and hail Lucifina. Rebecca, you silly, furry little butthole licker you. Okay, sometimes the suck hurts you in life. Other times, though, it helps. Like with fast-moving meat sack Matthew, who writes, What's up, suck master? I want to tell you about how getting Cummins lawed kept me from going to jail. That might be a little bit of an overreaction, but hey, it sounds cool, okay? Here's the story. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, and was heading up to Vegas for a weekend with some friends. Sounds fun. They got there Friday morning. I was supposed to leave uh, work at 12, meet them there around 5, ended up working later than I wanted, didn't get on the road until about 2.30. When I got a call from them telling me to, quote, hurry my bitch ass up. <laughs> so I started going maybe just a little faster than I should have. Well, about two hours into the drive, I'm still speeding down the interstate. And I see the one thing that makes everyone's butthole pucker. Flashing lights behind me. I pull over. And when the officer comes to the window, he sees the body slumped over in the passenger seat. And I just say, what is big deal? We're Russell bits. Maybe do a bit of stabbing and I come inside pants. JK, 
I like to JK sometimes too. No, he comes up to the window. And as I was trying to pull up the insurance on my phone, the Amanda Knox episode I was listening to starts to play and you're teaching your amazing language class, which made the officer laugh. He got all the information, walked back to me with just a warning letter and then said, do better than that. Nimrod would not approve. I was going well over the speed limit. So shout out to Officer Badass, you beautiful meat sack for letting me off with just a warning. Uh, thanks for all you do, Suckmaster, and the whole Bad Magic team. Life has been kicking me right in the balls, it feels re- uh, like recently. And listening to Time Suck and your comedy never fails to get my mind off the bad shit going on. Your loyal listener, Matthew. Oh, well, thanks, Matthew. Uh, it is such a reminder. I'm very excited, actually, even though I'm doing this new hour of stand-up on the road, to write the next hour. And uh, I find that I find this current hour, you know, gets a lot of laughs, but I want to make the next... I don't know. Sometimes with, uh, with stand-up, I lose perspective on how it is just so healthy and needed in life just to be able to laugh at someone's sense of humor. So it definitely motivates me to keep doing it. Uh, glad you didn't get a ticket. Hope you had a blast in Vegas, right? Showbiz. That town can uh, obviously get pretty crazy in a good in a good way or a bad way. Hope Lucifina didn't get you into uh, too much trouble there. And now for another Cummins Law victim. Let's hear from funny front butt dump Whitney, who writes, let's just skip the niceties and get into it, cocksucker. I found your podcast recommended in the uh, last podcast on the left, Reddit thread. That's cool. Uh, I started binge listening from the beginning because OCD. I will never understand meat sacks who bounce around and listen backwards. Yuck. Anywho, I am now of the lizard variety and have far too much merch that make, <laughs> that makes people squirm. Thanks, our warlock. You've gotten me so many fucking times with the lies that come out of your mush mouth, you asshole. I hope someone is making a list of your goddamn tricks and lies with episode numbers so listeners can check how we score on the stupid and gullible scale. First, front butt dump. I will never not think of that about vaginal births. Vaginal births happens to be a large part of my life. I am a labor and delivery nurse, you bastard. (laughs) Second, most embarrassing shit ever. Like many before me, Cummins Law got me and got me good. As I mentioned, labor and delivery nurse. I work nights. Thanks for keeping me awake for super long shifts. So I'm sitting next to the most chatty bitch on the unit. (laughs) So naturally, I put in my Bluetooth headphones to send the, I love all these hyphens, shut the fuck up, you dumb cunt signal. Uh, to her, it works about half the time. <laughs> so my patient calls out and I pull the headphones out and set them on the desk and go into her room. She's uncomfortable, needs help repositioning. So, uh, she's got an epidural, can't move herself. My dumb ass has stuck my phone in my pocket. And as I'm moving her, somehow my phone starts playing loud, like loud enough to wake up her snoring husband. Want to know what came out of your fucking mouth? Missouri is the cradle of civilization, according to LDS doctrine. And I got to say, this feels like the claim of a man who lived prior to the 20th century when the fields of archaeology and anthropology were much less developed. Teaching that human life began in Mississippi, uh, Missouri goes against all current scientific evidence regarding the origins of humankind, like all of it. Oh my heck, flipping awkward and so on with that shit until I can get to my phone. Did I mention I live in Utah where there are a lot of Mormon folk? Yes. That was the longest 20 or so seconds of my life. I couldn't get to my phone quick because my entire arm was under her numb and dead weight fucking legs. It was so uncomfortable. Flipping awkward, if you will. The rest of my shift, they hardly talked to me and I'm surprised I haven't heard about it from higher ups. Maybe they're awkward, but not tattlers. Either way, fuck you. JK, I'm so glad you and the Bad Magic crew are making the world more funny, living your dreams, you humans and Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell. Oh, Penny and Dee Dee. Are dope as fuck. Thanks for filling my external auditory uh, meatus with your funny, nearly lingual sounds so I don't punch my snoring husband when I can't sleep at night. Fuck you if you think this email is too long. Hail Lucifina, for she provides me with job security. Whitney. P.S. Your David Childress and Pootie and Juju have each made me actually pee my pants. Fucking mom bladder. (laughs) But for real, can we get a replica of Shirley's lunchbox? Uh, Well, first off, Whitney, thank you for teaching me a new word. I had never heard uh, meatus. Uh, I had to look it up. It's an opening, especially in a bone or bony structure, as in the opening of the ear or nose. Okay, cool. Uh, also, uh, I think Logan did look into lunchboxes for a while, but I'm just not sure what happened to that. I think we had a t- hard time sourcing that. Uh, maybe we'll try again. Uh, best of luck continuing to flush out all those little front butt dumps. Uh, may those human turds always come out breathing, healthy, with 10 fingers and 10 toes. And then one more. Uh, this one fucking killed me. It, this is just such a random occurrence for this to happen. Sounds like a random tech glitch gave, uh, excuse me, sucker, super sucker, David Ham, quite a uh, interesting little fever dream. So he writes, hi, Dan, the dungeon master, the suck, whip a wizard and slayer of shame, cock dragons, your constant bullshit facts and all the Cummins law confessions out there have me on high alert uh, to never get taken in by your fantasies. I pride myself on believing you'll never get me more than the one or two times I'm willing to admit. 
However, this wasn't intentional on your part. Just a cosmic joke played on me through my podcast app when it randomly started the next episode in the middle of the Helen Keller episode. Since I never look ahead to see what the next episode topic is, I was suspended in this fantasy for too long. I've been listening to the Helen Keller episode while going about my day, walking the dog in the woods, and eventually having myself a shower and continuing to listen. I was just at the point where you mentioned her romance with Peter Fagan. I had been so intrigued by the Helen Keller story so far because of all the things I didn't and never would have known, including her romantic life, which my small reptile brain never even considered that Lucifina may have taught Keller a few hand gestures. I was listening intently to learn more. You continued to say he will communicate with Keller by spelling into her hand. And then immediately next, you said, and right. And he thinks this is the same episode. You've been walking now for several hours on the rough mountain path. Your warrior father is riding ahead, fully armored, keeping a lookout. Your mother is driving the wagon, which is tethered to two oxen. The wagon holds all your worldly possessions, except for the sword gifted by your father, which you always carry on your person. So at this point, I am just standing there, stock still in the shower, absolutely enamored with how this Peter guy is spelling all of this in her hand. And you just keep on going with vivid scenery details. And my brain is cramping, trying to imagine how this even worked and how long it would take and who remembered the exact words and what the fuck is going on. Did Helen Keller just get introduced to D&D? You followed up afterwards by saying, if this sends a shiver of anticipation down your spine, you might be a Dungeons and Dragons player. I was shook by the notion that Peter Fagan had romantically wooed Helen Keller with his dungeon master prowess. <laughs> Took me a solid minute to understand what happened when you continue to only talk about D&D and no longer mention Helen Keller. I thought you'd find that amusing. Oh, I did. Thanks for all that you do, but please stop selling merch to my wife. We have a three-year-old to put through college one day, and I don't want to catch him wearing my Chikatilo shirt and drinking out of my Just Don't mug on my couch when he's 25, flipping through tarot cards and reading scary stories. Overall, three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. David Ham. David, holy shit, man. That message did make me laugh so hard. I mean, j- just the the odds that your podcast player would skip to the next episode is such a perfect time to, s- to send such a confusing, to paint such a confusing, just, you know, scenario. Yeah, that would have been ridiculous. I would have been also listening to be like, what the fuck is happening? I love the thought of Helen Keller playing d and I-, I love some dude wooing her with D&D talk even more. Man, Peter must have rolled a perfect charisma score. Uh, thanks for all the messages, everybody. Please keep sending in these messages. Uh, updates, shout outs, coming law nonsense, and more to Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com. And that concludes this week's Time Sucker updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Please do not squash any peaceful protests this week with bullets and tanks. Just talk to them, open up a dialogue. And keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. I'm so glad I don't have to uh, do this podcast in in a communist nation like China. I would I wouldn't be able to. There would be no suck dungeon. It would be called like the state studio for audio information and constructive storytelling. Uh, there would be no time suck. I think I think uh, it would be called like learning time. And then episodes would be like, hello, I am Dan Cummins and welcome to learning time recorded in the state studio for audio information and constructive storytelling. Today, we will be talking about the Western lie of the Tiananmen Square protests that never happened. No one protests in a perfect democratic dictatorship of a utopia because life here for me and everyone else is perfect. I am happy perfectly happy recording these audio facts for you today. Also, Bojangles is dead. That capitalist lapdog has been put down by stronger and superior communist might. Hail the CCP. Long live China. Long live hot, hard CCP father daddies simply dripping in sexy soy sauce. Mmm.